The scientific revolution starts now. No, I'm excited to talk magnetic fields. How are you doing? Good, pretty good. I'm also excited about talking about magnetic fields with you both. <laughs> Always with anybody. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> people on the street, people on the bus. <laughs> That's one of the worst parts about being a scientist is you you go out into the real world and uh, it's very hard to get people excited about these kind of things. You you go to a I don't know whatever it is you do. We like rock climbing, so you go to a climbing gym, or we like music too, and try to talk about magnetic fields with normal people, and it's just yeah, doesn't it's work out. Yeah, no, but I, I think that they find it interesting because it's one of the things that people are not familiar with. And they're like, oh, can you tell me about the magnetic fields? What do we care about them? Mm. You know, like, how do we even measure them? Or like, and then they're like, oh, oh, and there's a lot of oh and wow, or oh, I didn't know. And, and it's very, very exciting uh, when you have this wow moment from people. Well, they're kind of the last pieces of magic in the world in some sense, you know? If you see, you show a, a kid two magnets, you know, and they get to play with them. It's almost like, it's very difficult to understand. And then even if you go to take physics classes, right? You go to college and take first year physics, maybe you're a pre-med major or something, you study magnetism, but you still don't really understand what's going on. It's just these mysterious forces that's holding them together. And I think in some sense, magnetism represents one of the last really deep mysteries of the physical universe i mean there's obviously a, a couple others but mm -hmm. magnetism is one that everybody's familiar with on a day-to-day -day. yeah i agree with that so like the the experiments are fun though you see the effects right of the magnetic field in matter but then when you i think i agree with you so like when when you really want to understand what happened you really need you really need to go into math uh, yeah and that's one of the things that math or magnetic fields are noisy and you need to develop a lot of large equations and not really straightforward um, logical interpretation of them um, so then also maybe that's also complicated for for people uh, too because you end up in a point that you don't work with linear equations they're just like derivative and then like effects of how the derivative work and cross uh, terms that you need to start working on it and the math are no like basic math. I think mean, you know, fundamental math. You need to really have uh, some level of uh, math that higher degree than perhaps high school or high level um, math in, in college. Yeah, it's really it's interesting to me that physics is okay with stopping at the math. You know, if you if you ask how magnets work, like someone might be like, well, atoms are kind of like act themselves like little magnets, and then you get these assemblies and there's these spin properties and all this stuff, but it's interesting because I feel like in biology, if all you, if you, at the end of the day, you were trying to explain, you know, how DNA replicates and you just had math, that wouldn't be sufficient, right? You'd have to, uh, it, in some sense, because of the fact that we assigned the material actors to the biological processes and didn't just stop at the math, that allowed us to actually get even further. And I wonder if you've like thought at all about why people don't really interest themselves in trying to come up with structural material explanations for things like at the fundamental scale. Like I understand that you can build technology, plenty of technology with just field equations and so forth. But do you think you could go even farther if people were concerned with material representations like we do in biology or something? You mean uh, uh, for applications in, in astronomy or just in general? Uh, I'm just thinking about fun a lot of fundamental physics is it terminates in math, right? Yes. But that's not really the way it works in a lot of the other sciences. Like chemistry even has to, a lot to do with the shapes of the orbitals interacting. Uh, biology especially, like I was saying, genetics has to do with the way that di different genes are affecting one another through actual mediated uh, events, right? So polymerases, binding transcription factors. And you can totally imagine a world where biology didn't do that. Like, what if biology, they just had fields to describe genetic fields, right? And the genetic <laughs> fields were inherited and the genetic yeah. fields had different forces upon one another and stuff. It could be totally accurate. In fact, you might even have all the same technology, 
I don't know. Would you have all the same technology? I mean, that's the thing. When I started to think about it like that, I really was suspicious of whether or not you would have the same technological process in a world where it is very mathematical. Because the way that you describe magnetic fields where you say that you probably have to have math that goes beyond the high school level, it starts to become perhaps a little bit not intuitive. Mm -hmm. And it turns into a discipline that's very, very... I don't want to say exclusionary because I don't think that everybody has access to all disciplines, but yeah. I do think that there's something inherent about the way that humans tinker, mm -hmm. which is that they see things in their minds and they play with them and they roll them around and they imagine them. And if we speak only in mathematics rather than objects, then it's hard to think of how those things fit together and how you would manipulate them downstream of that. Yeah. So I think that okay, that is interesting. So I think that the the main difference here is that the fields that you're talking about, uh, you can you can experiment in a lab, right? You can touch it and you can make an experiment and you can apply the scientific method in order to uh, to see what happened with the with the application, right? So you were talking about the DNA or you were talking about uh, I don't know, let's say a uh, superconductor so, or, or some new materials, but you are in the lab doing it. So the point of, for us in, in astronomy, we don't have a lab. We cannot simulate galaxies. We cannot simulate stars. We cannot simulate the environment of the, any part of the, of the, of the universe in a, in a small lab. Um, so then it became an issue for us because we, the only thing that we have is, is all empirical. If we make an observation and we have to interpret the observations and then we cannot make an experiment uh, in order to test it. So the, the only experiment that we need to do is like go to another object. We can be a galaxy, can be a star, can be a planet, and then go to another one and see what is the other difference there and try to um, uh, understand the difference between them. So then we rely a lot into physics. And at the end of the day, math, in order to explain the difference between the environments that we are observing. So I think that's, that's the maybe the main difference uh, here is like, we can have, uh, we cannot have advantage, advantages in, I don't know, the theoretical uh, understanding of magnetic fields in the universe if we don't have like a full fundamental mathematical description of it and that we can apply very simplistically with very uh, naive uh, assumptions into something that we observe in the, in the universe. Uh, maybe like in, in the lab, you can play with uh, the temperature, for example, you have a material and then you start decreasing the temperature of the, of the, of the material. And then you end up with, the, uh, with some um, a, a specific uh, behavior. For example, you go from regular temperature um, uh, in, in the lab to uh, very low temperatures and then you end up with superconductivity and then that's it and then you start uh, applying the magnetic field on it and then you see that the magnetic field is repelling for example some part of the of the material at some specific temperature and then you discover new things and then after that you explain it with some physics uh, behind uh, behind the, the experiment but in our case it's just uh, it's all empirical at the end. Yeah, at the end of the day, just testing, observing. Mm -hmm. I hadn't thought about the utility of the laboratory experiment in context of maintaining a visual model. Because, mm -hmm. like, I wonder, when you think about magnetic fields, do you think about them in terms of, do you see something in your head, or do you think in math? Oh, <laughs> Uh, I see in, in flow, right? So you have, for example, uh, like a, a, a flow of energy or matter moving uh, moving around. And then you have, so what I, how I normally see it is the, the matter is moving along some uh, field lines or with well, the lines that can exist, you, well, that it really exists, it's just a flow of energy going uh, through the through space. Mm -hmm. And then what I, what, so normally what I think is like, is what is the effect of the magnetic field on those uh, material that um, I'm observing, 
let's say, for example, that I'm serving uh, some hydrogen or some uh, something that we call in galaxies, we call dust. It's just a, a, it's a, a organic uh, compounds uh, of a micrometer in size uh, formed with carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, other components. And you also have iron inclusions on it. And then because you have iron inclusions and you have a somatic field in the medium inside of the galaxy, so then it start moving along the magnetic field lines. And then I mean, think, I, I think about like how the, those kind of particles will move around the, the lines, depending on how strong is the line, how strong is the magnetic field, or uh, how is the shape of these uh, organic uh, particles. And then if you have a, a star very close by, so maybe it's pushing all the matter one way and then you have a magnetic field another way. So how that will affect. And then when you when I have that picture, uh, I will work with uh, uh, with a bit of equations, of course, and then simulations uh, too. Yes, uh, just to very simplistic simulations of of a star, for example, pushing radiation, and then you have a magnetic field around. So what happened with uh, with the matter? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe before we get too much deeper into this, you could just introduce yourself to our audience and and tell everybody a little bit about the questions that drive you and really what got you to this place where you you spend all of your time thinking about the you know the, the cosmic significance of magnetic fields and their place in the universe yeah so yeah so my name is uh, enrique lopez rodriguez uh i'm a researcher uh in stanford university in the cable uh institute for particle astrophysics and cosmology uh, I'm originally from uh, from Spain, from the Canary Islands. This island is very close to Morocco, but very far away from mainland Spain. Um, and then there I study uh, my bachelor uh, and my master uh, degree there in the, in the islands. They have a very strong uh, astronomy uh, program. Um, uh, and in during the during the master, I did a project on. Cataclysmic variables. Is this a super? Is this a black holes that have a uh, accretion disk uh, around uh, with uh, with accretion disk? Is because you have a star orbiting around, and then it's basically uh, accreting the the gas from from a star. And one of the professor has uh, uh, some observation from one of the telescopes uh, in in the Canary Islands, and they wanted to observe uh, if, what is the what the effect of the magnetic field of the star or the central black hole in the in the star orbiting around, and then they use some a uh, technique we can talk uh, later. So they use some technique called uh, polarization to estimate the the magnetic field, and it totally blew my mind. It's just like okay, we have a way to estimate the effect of the magnetic field and separate the components of the electromagnetic wave. I was like, okay, this is my jam. I really like this, and then I haven't stopped since since my uh, master until now to using the technique and try to um, understand more the effect of the magnetic field in 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 the universe uh, itself. Hey, everybody! Are you listening to this? Thinking, how can I make this podcast reach even more people and become more powerful and explore all of my favorite topics? Well, there's a solution to that. And you could come over to join us at Discord and tell us your ideas. You can come over to Facebook, leave a comment, subscribe to the channel if you aren't already. And if you've already done all those things, consider joining the insider community at patreon.com. Because for just a couple dollars a month, you can not only support this project and help it grow and become more strong and more robust and guarantee the future lifetime of this project, but you can also get in on our weekly discussions. We meet up every Sunday and hash it out about what's cool in the universe of science and ideas. And we consider ways to make the project better. And we want to have you at that discussion table. So come on over. And now uh, these days make me wake up in the morning every day just to understand uh, how the magnetic field affects the evolution of, of galaxies. Uh, basically, like we have a star formation happening along uh, all the evolution of the of the universe um sometime and then 
uh, depending of, of the rate of the of the star formation, so then maybe the magnetic field have some effect on it. And I want to understand what happened with uh, with that. Oh, it's such a fresh field. It seems like I mean we've had we've had a few people on the show to talk about star formation, planetary formation, and we ask them a little bit about the role of electricity and magnetism, and they're kind of like, well, I'm sure it's important, but we don't know, <laughs> and so. I'm really excited to have you here, actually, because you're one of the first people we could track down that's actually working on this problem. Maybe not star formation, but the organization of the galaxies. And so, yeah, just what I mean, it just seems like it's a wide open field. Are there a lot of people working on this? It, it, do you feel like it's kind of the early days or who were who you looking up to when you first got into the field? Yeah, so interestingly, uh, there is a, a group of people who has done uh, measurements of the magnetic field in galaxies and, and try to estimate what is the effect of magnetic, uh, magnetic field in galaxies uh, since uh, four or five decades ago. So what you see in, in, in mainly in Germany, in the Max Plan. So there's a, a strong team of people who use uh, radio telescopes uh, to estimate uh, the magnetic field in, in galaxies, uh, and usually uh, nearby galaxies. Um, they, they so all so who are looking is just basically the literature they have done and they're they have been very prolific for the past uh, uh few decades and you have many reviews and many papers every every year about it uh just observing uh, nearby galaxies like the galaxies in the local universe uh that can be resolved you they're very well studied uh we have a, a more or less a good understanding of the of the formation of stars, the dynamics, and also the evolution of these galaxies. And what the people have been uh, estimating is the this large scale magnetic field on spiral galaxies. And they found that all galaxies have magnetic fields and all of them have uh, a magnetic field that more or less follow the spiral arms of galaxies when you mm. see them, uh, when you see them face on. Okay. Can uh, you Mm -hmm. break that down for me a little bit so I can visualize yeah. it a little bit better. So I know, when I think of a magnetic field, say around a solenoid or something like that, I think of basically this toroid shaped, you know, field essentially, right? The and, and the field is essentially telling me what the effects are of putting a charged particle in its a moving charged particle in its vicinity, right? Mm -hmm. So what is the shape of these fields around one of the spiral arms? Is it also toroidal like that? Or or what is how is it can i how can i imagine it so so you can so you can imagine so a galaxy is basically a disk uh, orbiting uh, across in the in the center you have a supermassive black hole in the center and then due to the angular momentum so everything is is orbiting around right so just a very simplistic uh, toy idea about it and then you form these uh, spiral arms which is basically uh, a concentration of of uh, matter uh, where you have usually more stars forming there and more uh, vari uh, variants there too. So, uh, so then if you have a magnetic field there. So what's going to happen? Like you're going to have uh, some uh, differential rotation of the of the galaxy that is pushing the magnetic field uh, to be also orbiting around and following basically the, the the matter of the of the disk. And then you end up with something that's like a spiral shape. And then to it, and then uh, whipping around into into the into the center. So you have a spiral, and then some kind of like a logarithmic spiral, for example, and then uh, that points towards the the center of the of the galaxy. And that spiral uh, B field move along the whatever the dyna uh, dynamics the disk of the galaxy has. If they if they are fast rotating, so then you have a more tight uh, B field, maybe more toroidal. And if you have, for example, a uh, galaxy that's being interacted with another galaxy, uh, and then you have some mergers or something, so then you have a spiral B field that's like a little bit more open. Mm -hmm. And then you have B, uh, B fields that goes away from the disk of the galaxy and connect with another galaxy, with the, the other, with the other galaxy. Um, but that's the, the large scale B field. So normally you have the, these galaxies are usually like, I don't know, eight kiloparsec, 10 kiloparsec scales. Uh, and then what we are observing is that in general, the magnetic field 
has a 10 kilo per sec scale uh, a spiral beef field. But that doesn't mean that you have only one line of that size. What happens is that you have maybe a lot of twist line in a very small scale, but all those twists, when you average down, they're all pointing in one direction. Hmm. So when you look at so when you look at the uh, at these uh, no resolve um, observations of of galaxies, uh, you see this large scale be filled, and then you say, oh, okay. In general, they looks like one line uh, uh, of this uh, of the size of the of the galaxy. But actually, what happened in reality is that you have like many twists and many loops within the the resolution element of the of the observations that is more or less pointing along the direction of rotation of the of the galaxy. And these fields are uh, they're they're produced by the acceleration of charged particles. Is this a fundamentally an electromagnetic process? Yeah, yeah. So what the origin is uh the origin we don't know. <laughs> where where they mm. where did the field come from? Mm. So I certainly this is like a, a major Thing in astronomy, we observe magnetic fields everywhere, except for the ones that are, that are generated in in stars because it's generated inside of stars. But it's just like in the interstellar medium uh, or the intergalactic medium, the medium between between galaxies. So we measure magnetic field everywhere, but we don't know exactly yeah where that come from. So we know that the magnetic field should be like increasing with uh, with time like be more uh, stronger uh with time so and what happened here is that you have uh, something that we call um uh, dynamo effects so the dynamo effects is basically the uh the conversion of kinetic energy into magnetic energy the kinetic energy is basically the movement of particles uh in the medium and these th these particles are charge so then it generates uh, a magnetic field so then you can imagine that there are particles everywhere they're charged uh, uh, everywhere so magnetic field is very easy to generate so once you generate the magnetic field there's no way that you can destroy it so it's gonna be there so you can dissipate it but you cannot destroy the the magnetic field so so the only thing that is going to happen is that if you have a magnetic field for example at the beginning of the of the universe created somehow there's some theories about it so then that's very very small we think that it's around i don't know 10 to the minus uh 20 gauss or something like that and the magnetic field that we measure in galaxies is 10 to the minus 6 so it's 14 order of magnitude of increase of the magnetic field and the way of of general of uh, of uh, Increasing the magnetic field strength is uh, a one is like, for example, compression. So you have magnetic field, if you have the energy, so you need to conserve the amount of, of magnetic field. So then if you compress it and you have more magnetic fields per, per volume, so then that means that you need to increase the magnetic field strength. And that happens, for example, when you have the structure of the cosmic web. The cosmic web is these uh, filaments of uh, the early, uh, early universe where you form the flows of matter forming the, the previous uh, galaxies between and the galaxies right yes and then after that so you have uh you have uh, the formation of galaxies so then it compresses the field more then you have angular the differential rotation of the of the disk so then it creates a dynamo that's like orbiting around and then you have accretion uh onto supermassive black holes and galaxies and stars it, it amplify the magnetic field more and then you have the explosion of the stars that also amplify the magnetic field so then a combination of all that is basically what makes the big field to to do it it's a, it's a matter of a, a magnetic dynamics plus compression uh and plus dynamos uh going on is it surprising that the magnetic field continuously increases as opposed to dissipates? Uh, it dissipates uh, in the medium between galaxies mm -hmm. because you push matter away and then the matter, you know, like expanding mm -hmm. uh, and then cool down and then 
uh, it has less density, so the magnetic field should decrease. Oh, so, oh, so you're saying that it's, it increases on the lifespan of a galaxy? Yeah, I yes. So the lifespan of the galaxy, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but, but, but we cannot explain the magnetic field that we are measuring right now. So we yeah. know that it is increasing, but we don't know how. We, we don't have a simulation or we don't have a theory that explains the levels that we observe uh, these days. Does that disturb you? Yes, every day. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, so w what do you mean you don't have a theory? Because there's a lot of electrical stuff that's in galaxies. Is it not? Is there not enough electrical stuff that's just moving around to create it? Uh, uh, yes, yeah, but it, it's a lot of stuff, but we don't have a theory to explain it. Uh, that, it's very, that, that's, it's very that, complex. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what it, mm -hmm. Well, I was going to say, I, I tried to do a little, a few slides on this when I was lecturing on galaxy structure last semester, or back last fall. Uh, you know, I teach this first year astronomy course, essentially. And um, looking at the maps that they had, at least when I was preparing that lecture, it was very chaotic. Like, I couldn't really put my finger on, it wasn't like a beautiful solenoid where you just have these nice coils of wire, right? Mm. You have these little pockets of polarity here and there. And like, I think what you were saying is that they sum on average to some, some, let's say, global galactic magnetic field. But there's so much local variability that I think it the turbulence of that makes the situation very difficult to model. Well, I mean, yeah. even just looking at the sun, because you see pictures of the sun's magnetic field and it just makes me uncomfortable to look at yes. because I'm like, why? This should be ordered. This should be just a beautiful Taurus. I don't understand. And what... yet it has a north and south on average, right? That, yeah, that in, yeah. That invert periodically. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's like, it's the same question every, every, every day. It's just like, we observe it and, like, and the people tell me, can you explain it? No, I can't. So, and then the theories only have one theory or two and then it doesn't work neither. So like, it's like, it annoys me at some, at some point too. It, it's very, very disturbing, as you, as you say. It's like, we observe it it's everywhere. We know that they have effects in the formation of stars and the motion of gas uh, in galaxies, but still the people don't take them into account. Uh, the people, I mean, the, the, the general uh, um, uh, astronomers uh, explaining um, formation of star formation of galaxies. And the other thing is uh, we cannot explain the things that we're observing. So so then yeah, it's, it's just it's very complicated. <laughs> what do you mean you can't explain the things that you're observing? So what it means like for example this large scale uh, magnetic field uh, that we're observing there in all all galaxies. We observing every single galaxy that we observe has lar that large scale we feel. More order, less order, more spiral, more, uh, uh, so more, the spiral are maybe more open or less open depending on the dynamics of the, of the galaxy. But then when we want, when we go to the theory of, uh, of how the galaxy, uh, uh, being evolved and we add in, for example, in the theory in simulations, we add magnetic field. Uh, there is no a single simulation that explains the observations as we observe it nowadays. It's always something missing. And other, and we don't know if it's the the physics of the microdynamics that we don't understand, or maybe as as, as you say the the turbulence, for example, the turbulence we don't understand turbulence mm -hmm. uh, either, and the turbulence has a huge effect in how do you generate a uh, magnetic field, um, and then we don't have resolution on the observations uh, in the simulations, for example, uh, to uh to generate that the turbulence that we need um so then it's always something missing but we don't know what it is and then and then we need to start adding small ingredients and then run the other simulation with more ingredients and more simulation but it's been like this for decades and still we haven't uh figured it out yet okay so in oh, did you yeah because well, i was going to try to understand is the magnetic field there first and then the galaxy forms or the galaxy forms and it creates the magnetic field? So the magnetic field has been there since early in the, since the early stage of the universe. Okay. Uh, so then galaxies form just because you have gravity and then, and then you have gravity. 
is collapsing and then forms the 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 the, 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 the galaxy. Uh, the magnetic field uh, are along the along the right in the early stages of the of the universe. So all this what I say like the cosmic wave formation, structure formation, galaxy, the proto galaxy formation. The the magnetic field are just like along the right with the gas flows, and then when uh, because the matter are um, condensed, uh, been co been compressed, uh, so then the magnetic field is kind of like increasing and increasing in strength. And then there is a point that we don't know yet uh, where the magnetic field start being relevant in the formation of galaxies or in the formation of stars within the galaxy. So then the galaxy will happen just like drag the magnetic field with it, and then you have all this all the particles and it, uh, are moving around. So then it generates the magnetic field. Uh, so it can kind of amplify the magnetic field that is already there. Uh, and then there is some point when it starts form. Uh, that that you need to have the effect of the magnetic field. So what I say here is that um, it start form because of gravitational collapse. You have a clump and then a collapse, and there is a point where you reach uh, a threshold of temperature and density that is start the fusion of hydrogen into helium, and then you form the star that way. Uh, the point like that collapse, it also drags the magnetic field into the, the the core and there is a point where is a balance between the gravitational collapse and the magnetic pressure and 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 then if you have a a, a, a magnetic field and in the environment for some reason you have a, a slightly larger uh magnetic field than usual so then that magnetic field stop the collapsing and then you can form stars and then what and then and then we can we can actually um explain why we don't have some uh, some of the very high mass stars or that amount of galaxies in in every in every sorry at some amount of stars in every galaxy just because of this uh, balance between the gravitational collapse and the magnetic field and you need it in order to, to have that because you know you will have so many stars in the universe and it need to have another another uh mechanism the climatic field in order to to avoid the collapsing and create so many stars um, on it. And so the, you're saying that the magnetic field at that point is repulse is acting against the force of gravity. Yes, exactly. So what happened exactly? So it's not repulsive; it's just like it, it moves the matter uh, along the along the mis along the bifid lines. I see. Right. I see. So you're collapsing, and then you have magnetic field this way, pointing radially, right? Because the gravitational collapse is, is radial. There is a point that the, the magnetic field is so strong that actually it's right and go radially it does some kind of like an hourglass uh shape oh, and the matter that goes inside it, it has to follow the b-field lines and then and then and so uh, it leaves yeah it leaves or move around and create perhaps creates the an, uh, an accretion disk around the the center uh, uh core of a protostar or create a protoplanetary disk, or create who knows uh, what after all. And so, yeah. in terms of the relative importance between magnetism and gravity and chemistry, where do you place magnetism in the formation of galaxies and the formation of stars relative to gravity and chemistry? Because we tend to think about these things exclusively gravitationally, and we've had conversations with people. Like we talked to Constantine Batygin, we talked to Eric Pettigura, and they had a very. Uh, they didn't deal with magnetism. They didn't really deal with chemistry. They were they nope. just dealt with neutral hydrogen, mm -hmm. and were perfectly happy with that. And we're like, I don't, I don't mess with that. That's just really, <laughs> really difficult. And even as we were talking to them, I think that Shiloh and I both kind of came away from that conversation wondering why, if they don't deal with it, are the paradigms so gravitationally centered? Is it because gravitation is just far and away the absolute strongest thing and so we just assume that it must be so? Or is it because it's just difficult to study the other things from a distance and be able to map them. I yeah, think electromagnetism is stronger than gravity by a long shot. I, uh, yeah. 
Yeah, I think I think you make you raise a, a very good point here. I think it's a combination of both. So on one side, gravity is easy, is known, and the equations everybody knows them, and they are linear equations, very easy to to uh, to develop and to make simulations uh, about it, um, and also to understand too. It's pretty straightforward. Um, uh, I think explain gravity can explain more, many many things uh, in the in the uh, formation of galaxies. I think uh, let's say like uh, the galaxy uh, formation of galaxy at the beginning it won't uh, be affected by magnetic field that for sure. Uh, but then what happened in the galaxy and the evolution of, of the material inside inside the galaxy? The material means the gas flows and the formation of stars and the formation of uh, uh, supermassive holes in the in the center and also like jets and uh, formation too that depends on the magnetic field and and that is very, very well proof uh if the researchers want to use it or not it's depending on the science that they want to 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 solve mm -hmm. uh, right mm -hmm. if if they if some people are interested in in galaxy formation and don't want to resolve uh, galaxies because on their simulations a galaxy is just a data point it doesn't matter to have magnetic fields there. It's just gravity, mm -hmm. uh, dark matter, and let it, the simulation run. And then you have most of the behavior of the structure of the universe there. So the more complicated, so then like once you start thinking about what happened in cell of the galaxy, so then exactly, you need to have full magnetic dynamics and then chemistry. And the chemistry means uh, heavy metals, and or or and organics uh, too, mm -hmm. uh, there. and then you need to have also magnetic field because, as you say, accretion into supermassive black hole, jet formation, and stars. If you don't have magnetic field, for example, in uh, in a in a simulation that form a galaxy, you may end up with way too many uh, stars, more than uh, more than we observe, and that's mm -hmm. a problem. So. If you work on simulate, I don't know, and explore simulations. So, but they say, just uh, if you work on simulations, so then what you can do is like you can um, tweak the simulation to create the amount of stars that you see in observations. You basically like uh, uh, tune, yeah, tune in the simulation just to end up with some amount of star formation that you that you observe. That, that that means that you're missing some physics. Sure, like, yeah, because the idea would be that you would be able to just start the simulation with your first parameters and then get the outcome that fits reality. Exactly, exactly. So simulation, you solve for initial conditions. You don't solve for the output. Mm -hmm. And that, that's, that's, that's a very important point uh, there, exactly. So it's not about what is the output, it's just like what are the initial conditions and you solve for those initial conditions. And then you do a simulation for different initial conditions and then compare them afterwards. And so do you think that you can get something out of it after you tweak simulations that way that tells you about some fundamental misunderstanding that we have? Or is the tweaking kind of just another step in this tendency to add constants until things fit? Yeah, yeah I... <laughs> I, I have a strong opinions about this. <laughs> uh, um, my opinion is that you should just put physics on, on the simulations. I know they're more complicated. You need to start with something simplistic and then start adding one thing at a time uh, and then see the effects of that one thing uh, and then uh, solve everything numerically and then, and then let it run. Uh, I think the tweak is just because you have a... Uh, you have very massive simulations, uh, and then that need to be used for different uh, practices and for different groups. Uh, so then it's a matter of like how much physics do you want to put in the in the simulation? How what is the cost, computationally speaking, on running that simulation? So then you need to start working to a balance. Like okay, what are the necessary physics that I need? Physics that I need in order to solve question one, two, three, four, five. And then, and then you end up removing magnetic fields because I usually not understandable. Uh, and then the people don't have a very good uh, understanding. Yeah, they don't have a very good understanding of them. And also numerically, it takes a long time to run uh, those ones too. 
Is all... it because you just have to stimulate a lot of different individual particles that are creating the turbulence and the movement in the field? Yeah, yeah. It's some turbulence, and then you need to solve all the ideal uh, microdynamical uh, equations where you have a lot of derivative cross uh, terms and no linear equations. So then that is more complicated, computationally speaking. Uh, but I think that's the right way to do it. So then people doing it. Uh, so I think I'm glad that uh, that is a new trend of uh, of simulations that the people have uh, are adding uh, magnetic fields because uh, because what you say is that they don't explain everything that we observe. So then these observations that the people have done for the past uh, several decades in in Germany plus the one that we are doing now for the past several years, the people are saying, okay, maybe magnetic fields are one of the physics that can that need to be added. So then some of the simulations are adding uh, this uh, magnetic field by for the long for the long run. Uh, right now we're just playing around with very um, basic uh, with fundamental physics, uh, fundamental magnetic field on on them only. Do you think that magnetic fields might play into some of the other cosmological, I don't want to say crises, but cosmological problems? Like I'm thinking of, you know, something like dark matter or the galactic rotation problem that the organizing structure doesn't seem to just be easily explained by gravity, right? We have to plug in all of this missing material in order to make that happen. Do you mm -hmm. think that there's a role for electromagnetism in those processes? So I think that there, there are few works uh, that have been playing with that idea. Uh, the idea means uh, uh, to add a very strong magnetic field uh, to explain the, ro the rotation of galaxies. But uh, I think they can explain it, but you need to have a very, very strong magnetic field. A strong magnetic field like, is, is the few order of magnitude stronger that we observe, and also several order of magnitude that uh, that the theory predicts from a primordial, a primordial magnetic field. So in order to have that, you need to have a very, very strong magnetic field in the early stage of the universe, but several order of magnitude. And if you plug in that magnetic field at the early stage of the universe, that magnetic field will modify the whole structure of the universe. And we don't see that. Uh, it's basically dominated by, by gravity and the magnetic field uh, amplify. So, uh, I don't think that magnetic field affects the, the the full dynamics of the of the of the galaxy just because yeah because you need uh, a physical uh, strong magnetic field um, and then could, could that be an averaging problem like if you're talking about averaging all of these different fields whose polarities are in different directions and then you're saying that that average field is kind of weak. Could it be that you're just not taking into account all of the nuance of the strong fields that are summing together? Uh, I normally think in in my definition energies, right? So you work on energy, so then so then the energy is like the square of the of the magnetic field. Uh, uh, the like energy, the energy density of the yeah the energy density of the exactly. region. Yeah. yeah. So. Then uh, that's a that's a, a, an additional uh, um, quantity. So and then what you're talking is about how much magnetic energy do you need in the galaxy as a global object in order to affect the rotation of the galaxy. And that magnetic field energy is like is several orders of magnitude larger than than we we have. And if you have uh, exactly you have loops reversals of the magnetic field inside of the galaxy those are very very small scales like uh, uh, yeah and then also uh, a very small um strength of the magnetic field that we that we observe that won't add up anything uh onto the the global field so like speaking of reversals by the way um the sun right we were talking about earlier the sun's magnetic field reverses periodically Actually, actually, I guess the Earth does too, on a much longer time scale. Do you imagine that something like that could happen in galaxies? Like when we look at different galaxies, are they all oriented? Are their polarities oriented in some conserved fashion, or do you think there's some cyclic dynamicism to that? Oh, 
I mean, obviously, the time scales are probably way too long for observational confirmation. I just, I wonder, you know, because there's a lot of long cycle effects on Earth that we experience, right? That that are kind of periodically debated, like the the pr- precession uh, of the poles, uh, the reversal of the magnetic field on Earth, of course. The climate cycles, too, are really interesting. Um mm-hmm. Obviously, the Earth is spending some time in the dense region of a spiral arm, and then sometimes it's in the dark region, right, as it moves around the galaxy. And uh, I wonder if there's another cycle on top of that that concerns the polarity uh, that it's experiencing, or if if there's effects that you think that we could actually feel here on our planet. Oh, that's very interesting. So that we feel, uh, I think, so the the big feel of 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 the Earth, and then the big field that we see from the sun are several orders of magnitude stronger than the magnetic field in, in the galaxy itself. So anything that happened in the in the big field of the of the galaxy, it, we don't we don't really notice it uh, at all here. How is it possible that the big field of the galaxy is weaker than the big field of the sun <laughs> and the Earth? Density is one. Uh, but even at the center of the galaxy. Uh, well, in the center of the galaxy, maybe not. Okay, okay. Of the star form- of the, of the house hole, of the supermassive black hole, uh, right? So then you have a very strong magnetic field. But what I say, like, yeah, the magnetic field in the, in the disk of the, of the galaxy. In, sure, in yeah. That makes sense. Is, yeah, it's stronger than, than that. And the magnetic field in, in stars or star formation regions or around supermassive black hole, they are, yeah, they're stronger than, than us for sure. Yeah, yeah. But it's like if you are thinking about like the the Earth, I think it has a Gauss or something like that, and then the we feel that we observe in galaxies ten to the minus six, so it's just a million times smaller than the we feel around around us. So what you're saying is that if you were to look out and measure the magnetic field of a galaxy that's far away, so you can only just take the average, you can't differentiate the center versus the outskirts we're talking on an order of 10 to the minus six yes no yes uh, uh, okay yes they are the order exactly so the absolute magnitude is 10 to the minus six and the direction is very very interesting so i think i can answer both of your questions so uh yes there are some reversals of the magnetic field uh, in the disc uh the reversal is just like is like uh, you have a, uh, a spiral field pointing in one direction and then you have another spiral we feel pointing in another direction, a different radius. And that happened because uh, you have something that is uh, rotating and then you need to lose angular momentum. And in order to lose uh, angular momentum, you need to do some, some reversal there because the, angular, the only way to lose angular momentum is going up and down from the disk. Mm. And then create a loop. And that loop, because you are pushing it, you have some friction, it makes the spiral to to move at some point in uh, after time it makes the 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 big field to be in, uh, in opposite directions and that that we call reversals uh, and then we have a way to to estimate uh, to measure those uh, uh, that direction and and it's um a, okay how do we explain that so the way to estimate it is how do you how do you do you know uh, this um a, a glass a called calcite, uh, mm-hmm. the, is, uh, and then when you measure it, uh, when you look at a line, the line is split in, into two. Yeah, like the double refraction stuff. Exactly the refraction. Yes. So that's because you have the right the molecules that like, kind of like split the the light into two. You have something. You have the light one is the fast axis, and the other one is the is the the low axis, and then it makes the the refraction. So, and then because of you have the, the molecules uh, inside, so something, the same effect happen in, uh, a, in, the, in the plasma. Hmm. So you have intergalactic medium, the intergalactic medium, uh, the interstellar medium, sorry. The interstellar medium is basically a, a flow uh, of gas that also has some magnetic field uh, on it, uh, moving around. And if you see the traumatic line passing through along the July side, it will make that. Uh, it will also produce a uh, uh, split of the of the light. And then what happens here is like depending if you have the magnetic field pointing to you or pointing away to you, you will see the automatic waves moving in one direction or the other. 
Mm. And then you actually can uh, measure the orientation of the magnetic field by how much has the automatic wave rotate along the, the line of sight. Mm, this that is the polarization method that you mentioned at the beginning. Yeah, that's something called a uh, rotation measure. It's a Faraday rotation measure. Faraday, back in the time, uh, uh, figured that out uh, mathematically because he was not able to, to do it um, in the lab. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I measure that you should expect some rotation of the magnetic, of the dramatic wave given an, an amount of magnetic field along the left side, the direction of the magnetic field, and how much electrons do you have along the right side. Now, in uh, the call site, you get like double images, right? Yeah. Are, are you, why don't we see double images when we look out at the night sky? Why don't I see like two stars next to each other or something? <laughs> so well, for our eyes, uh, it's all, all optical, uh, right? So like we don't, we don't see that effect in the, in the in the optical uh, part of the dramatic wave. Mm. So you go to, to radio wavelengths and then to observe it with one specific technique uh, that mm. we call uh, a, yeah, the polarization uh, technique in order to, to see that. Ah, so this is because you're looking at neutral hydrogen, like the spin flip stuff or? Uh, yeah, something, something similar to that. Yeah, so in, in radio, you're looking at uh, the emission of electrons Orbit, orbiting around um, a magnetic field um, and moving around it. So then that movement or, and that radiation passing through uh, uh, MHD uh, microdynamic uh, flow, uh, so that it produces a uh, split of the, of the light along the light side. And uh, basically what you have is like, you have the light in the light of side, in your light of side move faster than the one that moves perpendicular to it. Mm. So then, depending on how strong the magnetic field is and how many electrons do you have on the left side, it, so this it will create some uh, um, uh, lack of time between the two components of the electromagnetic wave, and mm, then like and a phase shift. Exactly, a phase shift. And then what happens is that if you have a uh, the light moving along the left side like this, it will you will measure something, for example, rotated, mm, mm. just because this component is being uh, phase shifted mm. so, somehow, yeah. Well, this sort of highlights the importance of radio astronomy. I think people sometimes have a hard time understanding why the heck we care about radio signals. <laughs> but I know that people really had a hard time imagining how they were going to study. You know, they, I think people have the sense that hydrogen was the most abundant element, but it's, like you said, it's visible light goes right through it. And so how are you going to yeah. look at it? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's everywhere. I mean, you have hydrogen, you have everywhere. So then the 21 centimeter, which is the, the change of the spin uh, of the electron. So it will, it's, it, it supposedly won't happen uh, much. So, but because you have so much uh, uh, hydrogen in, in the universe, it's everywhere. And then it's a one technique that everybody used to do it. And then the point is like, because it's so much hydrogen and it's very easy to, to observe and very bright. Uh, so then people use uh, a polarimetry uh, in order to estimate the magnetic field along the light of sight, and, uh, which is in the, in the interstellar medium in, the, in our galaxy, or we use it to estimate the magnetic field where exactly where the hydrogen is located in the, in the galaxy. You can do both of them at the same, at the same time. That, that's one technique to do it. Do you think that our estimates for the elemental composition of the universe are accurate? Or are we missing, is it possible that we're missing some elemental abundance because it's just not in the right state to be seen? Because I just, I keep thinking about what you're saying about the models not coming out the way that they should. And I'm like, well, what could we be missing? And like compositionally, we could be missing something. And I've always been really surprised by the low abundances of things other than hydrogen in the universe. Yeah. I mean, like that one's, if, if, if we're missing something, I mean, you know, what is funny in astronomy, we only have two, uh, I think three elements in the periodic table, right? You, we have a uh, hydrogen, helium, and metals. <laughs> <laughs> that's it right so and uh, metals is what you call low abound and uh, low abundance because that's like one percent two percent few percent right mm -hmm. of, of the whole abundance 
uh, yeah, maybe something, but it is uh, the only way to form those heavy elements is, be, is in the core of stars. Mm. So in order to increase the abundance, then you need to have uh, a strong star formation rate, meaning more stars uh, that we observe in, in typically in, in galaxies in order to have more, more heavy metals uh, on it. Yeah, because most of these galaxies are assumed to be second generation stars at least, right? Yes. Which is yeah. really confusing when they're, because they've, this has been one of the most exciting things too. I, I'm curious for you to weigh in on it, but I don't know if it's totally outside of your expertise, but we give you permission to speculate freely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It won't count against your professional record. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the early universe, right? These James Webb data with these mature galaxies after, you know, a few hundred million years. That's that's pretty startling if you're expecting to need second generation materials to get these things going. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean it's fascinating. So we are discovering a, a bunch of new things that we didn't know that exist, right? With with JWST. I guess like that happened every single time that we have a very powerful uh, telescope observing new things. Is that happening every every single time that we have a new a new device? Uh but the point is like We've seen something more massive than we think, right? And then we see it, that the stars, ho uh, the, sorry, that the galaxies have formed fast. I think some of the galaxies have, have, have formed faster than, than we think too, and they're more massive than we think, uh, some of them. Um, uh, yeah, so you need, you need or the, the efficiency of, of galaxy formation to be stronger, or you need, uh, I don't know, some other physics that, we are, that we're missing. Uh, uh, there. The other thing too is that all these galaxies are basically point sources for us. We don't resolve those galaxies. So, and we are looking something very, very far away from from us. Uh, so then we don't know what is inside of that point source that we're observing. Maybe it lies a bunch of other galaxies inside of that, or maybe mm -hmm. you have uh, mergers. So maybe you have a bunch of uh, uh, proto galaxies going on. And then the only thing that we observe is a, is a integrated intensity radiation from, from it. And then we make speculations of, of it, right? Mm -hmm. So like we say, like, how much light is coming from this point? And then this point has some size. Uh, and then we infer the mass and the formation of stars, which are usually uh, very high. And they usually depend on models that we have from galaxies very nearby mm. to us. Is, uh, it, mm -hmm. is it possible that they're not galaxies? They can be, like, call it proto galaxies or or a or cluster of galaxies that are becoming a a, a very massive uh, one. But basically, it's just a. Uh, I think my interpretation: they're not the galaxies that we know nowadays. But I think they're like they want a uh, wanna be. Uh, galaxy, a <laughs> bunch of wannabe galaxies <laughs> uh, that we that we are that they are like kind of like merging because of the of the structure formation that you have a bunch of them like I don't know merging or something like that. But that's way out of my expertise. But I think that's my 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 comment on on it. I guess. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, yeah. I mean, I appreciate you commenting on it. We there's one gentleman. I don't know if you saw this paper that got a lot of attention, where this gentleman up in Vancouver proposed that perhaps the timeline was you know twice as long like the the time span of the universe that he could essentially repair some of the tensions you know the hubble tension and some other things especially these early galaxies if he extended the life of the universe much longer and it made a bunch it made people really angry um <laughs> as you can imagine so he's actually we just met with him this morning he's going to do a podcast later on uh, in the month so i guess we'll we'll take those issues up with him more and, and see what he comes up with yeah because, yeah uh, you know it's just an interesting thing because every every time you make a more powerful telescope well let me back that up all we have in astronomy is light right that's all we have is what we can see and so when we when we say the universe in astronomy it's not necessarily what a philosopher means when they say the universe in, in astronomy, the universe means what we can see, essentially. Mm -hmm. And so, 
it's very interesting when we bring these more and more powerful devices online that we can see maybe a little further. We can see maybe a little more detail. And all of a sudden, it's almost like the universe itself expands in our vision, right? And so I, I wonder if the next generation of telescopes will take that story even further. And, and we'll be able to, maybe the universe will get older, maybe uh, maybe new dynamics will appear in the theoretical landscape as a result of that. It's hard to say. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that it's exciting. Every single time that we have a new uh, observatory, um, new discoveries coming. So I think this is the most exciting thing from our, uh, in our film. Uh, there is every single time that we point a new thing, new wavelength, more sensitive, uh, higher um, uh, diameter of the telescope, uh, and you point the first time to something that you thought that you knew, you always discover something that's like, oh, okay, I never thought about this, or my theory is wrong, or like, okay, how, what is this new thing? For example, uh, in, in, um, in this field called, uh, we observe um, optical nuclei, is this galaxy that have a, a supermassive black hole in the center. Um, and then we have a prototypical uh, AGN, Arctic Latin Nuclei, in the local universe that we call NGC 1068, just a number. But These like, are like jets and, and all of this really dynamic stuff. Yes, yeah. So it's very it's a prototypical because it's very, uh, very close, very bright. Uh, and then it's easy for us to observe on any wavelength, any telescope that we want. And it's one of the first things that we observe when we have a new instrument. And every single time, without fail, every single time that we observe with a new thing, we discover something new that we didn't know before. And all the theories that we know about uh, optical Latin nuclei are based on that particular uh, uh, galaxy, which is every single time that you observe it, break the rule of the theory that we knew uh, uh, before. Uh, because, I don't know, you have a, a more powerful jet than you have before. Or maybe now, for example, we observe it with uh, our certain CTA with, uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, this instrument that we observe um, magnetic fields in nearby galaxies. And I discovered this large scale uh, magnetic field that, uh, in, the, in the galaxy that you have a, a, a very strong supermassive black hole in the center with a very strong jet. And I don't know where that large scale is there. That means that you have something very well organized with, uh, with an object in the center that is perturbing the galaxy. And I don't know where that comes from. I don't know. I don't know how to explain that. Uh, so then, yeah. Mm -hmm. Does, are there a lot of broken hearts when the theories change or how does that go over <laughs> <laughs> like behind closed doors? Yeah. No, no, it, it's good. I, it, we have, I, I say that because we have this object as a joke and every single time that we, that we observe it is something new. So I think that, I think it's good. I think it's, uh, it pushed the limits of, of our understanding on the, uh, crashing onto supermassive black holes and how galaxies, uh, evolve. And I think we need to be open all the time to what the universe uh, is telling us because we, uh, I said it before, it's just uh, all empirical. So we can now go to the lab and, and experiment with, uh, with it. I mean, one of the really nice things about astronomy, well, it's good and bad. One of the nice things is that it doesn't immediately impact events here on earth. Right. So I feel like especially planetary science, astronomy, they can kind of be on the move and they can be changing their minds about things in a way that, you know, if you change your mind about the way viruses work in the middle of a pandemic, it's kind of, there's a lot of difficulty in, in changing ships when you're implementing it. Or if you want to actually make something that has uh, technological implications here on Earth, it's very difficult to, without demonstrating it, to, without making a new machine or something, it's very difficult to change the way people think about it. But how, how do you take the work that you're doing on the cosmos and put it to use on earth is that something that's even a consideration yeah so we have we have a few examples uh with it for example uh we have the infrared uh, cameras uh so uh, for the uh so all these uh, ccd uh, developments uh have been some of them have been pushed by the by the astronomy field because we need to have a very high efficiency of CCD cameras because we want to use every single pixel in the in the camera, and then we want to uh, those pixels to be very efficient. Means that we are not losing photons that we are, are 
uh, observing. Uh, so then normally deficiency has been increased in the past few decades from like 20 to 30% to almost 100% of efficiency. So, and then we know, uh, so that, uh, and then those um, developments can be used for the camera that now the people use in the phones, for example, right? So all these developments are pushing for, for that. The infrared cameras are too. And the infrared cameras have both have the, the hour uh, for an astronomy, we need to observe uh, the temperature of, of the objects. Uh, so then uh, we need infrared cameras uh, for that. So we need to develop uh, the pixels that work on the infrared wavelength. And then also, sadly, from the other side, you have the military development too. And for the reasons that they have, uh, you know, to, to, to measure the temperature of the, of the bodies in, uh, at night. And then they need to be very efficient and they need to figure out how to, how to do it. Right. So, and you have both. So our, our case is just, uh, we go to longer wavelengths, uh, because we want to observe, uh, lower temperatures, uh, in the universe. So then we're pushing technology, uh, there. I think in terms of engineering, uh, point of view, uh, detector development, astronomy has done, uh, a lot. Uh, so. What, so, what about in terms of the basic science, in terms of just understanding the universe? Do, do you think that, do you think that understanding the cosmos is benefits humanity just on its face? I mean, I, I have an opinion, but I, I'm curious what yours is. <laughs> I would like to know your opinion too. So, uh, I think so. I mean, like, just the, just the, the pure question, like, are we alone in the universe? How, where we come from? And uh, where are we going? Right? So these are fundamental questions that everybody has asked since early uh, stages of, of humanity, right? And then we are trying to answer that more empirically and more, uh, uh, with some logic and physics behind that. But at the end of the day, the main question that drives new uh, uh, observatories are the same one. Are we, it's a, 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 this is a human uh, question, right? That, that, that I say, I think that everything that we, that we do, independently how far it is from the day to day life, I think end up to be a good thing for the whole uh, humanity in the long, in the long term. Hmm. Even though maybe, uh, now we're talking about magnetic fields. Yes. Right. So maybe there is a no, a clear implication of it, but perhaps the development of the, of the, uh, simulations that we are doing and the math that we are doing may help uh, somebody to use that for I don't know, imaging uh, in MRI, for example, in in the medical uh, field or in other um, fundamental uh, material physics. But it's also a very mythological discipline. You know, every culture on Earth has stories of where they came from, how the Earth came to be, how the universe came to be, the stars, the sky. Mm -hmm. And, you know, cosmology and the origin of the universe seems to me to be a scientific version of the same creation myths that people have been writing for eternity, basically. Many. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm hmm no, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I think that like, thinking about, um, that's very good. So I think thinking about that we observe the past is something that the people don't really realize in the first instance. You need to really explain uh, that every single time that we observe, we observe something from the past, right? So we have here um, a program for students that are no uh, science uh, majors, and then we work, they work with us uh, during the summer. Um, just to learn about fundamentals uh, of mathematics and statistics, and they don't really have a, a, a strong uh, fun, a foundations of, of science. Um, one of the, the things that they normally, I always get the, the wall or I never realize it, is exactly that, like once it's the distances. So feel like, like try to put in your mind that the distances that we are talking about are no, go, is no from here to the next, uh, village right or here to another country just like that like light years distance right it takes light years to go somewhere and then in the galaxy that we have is like millions of giga years in order to do it and then every single time that you observe it is something that you have in the past that you don't observe anything right and i think that realization um is no uh, knowledge is no a common knowledge 
I, I, what I, what I see, you know, with, with the people I talk in the, in the streets or, or I talk with my family too, that they don't have a background in, in science neither. So I'm like, okay, what do you do? And then you just talk about these philosophical, uh, questions and like, okay, what are you observing? Okay. How long it takes the light to come here? I'm like, oh, I never thought about that. And like, how big is the universe? Oh, whoa. I never realized that. And like, and then you became, I don't know, maybe it's like a very significant point of view, but you became significant in all the problems that you have around, right? At, at the end of, of the day, even though we are working every day on things, but it's not, it's not something that we think and, and on a daily basis, because you know, I will be just depressed all the time, <laughs> but, but it's always in, in the background of your, of your fundamental um, uh, science that, that we do. Yeah, it's fascinating to think that somebody like billions of light years away from us in the future will might be observe the events that are happening right now, billions yeah. of years in the future, and that yes, will that's... be the present to them. It's that's it's really fascinating to think about that. But yeah. I, I do think there's something really fundamental about trying to understand ourselves in cosmology, and you know, like I remember. I was raised in like a sort of not really religious family, but I went to church and I heard the stories of how God created the universe. And then one day, maybe when I was 10 or 11, I found the physics section of the library. And there's these stories of the Big Bang and, you know, how everything came together. And it just seems like this question that's been asked, like you said, for thousands and thousands of years, people are very, very concerned with how we got here how everything here got here and where is it headed and cosmology and astrophysics are in this interesting position now that people are less interested in the church than ever before yeah and they're actually willing to step up and take a crack at some of these questions that people have traditionally asked religion mm -hmm. and i think that that puts scientists in a very uh it, it puts them in a new position that they weren't really cut out for in their original sense right and uh, yeah, I just wonder if cosmologists are up to the spiritual task, or is science capable of, of really addressing these kind of questions? Or yeah, hmm. the question, like it, 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 yeah, understanding where where we coming from. I think we are we are on the way to do it, but oof, I mean, at least that give us uh, some some years of work for for us. That's, what <laughs> it, 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 it. that's uh, so optimistic. That's sure. Yeah, that for sure. No, but but I think I mean yes, I guess. Uh, uh, yes, I think the cosmology is just answering that question. Um, I don't know if that will remove faith. I think that's that's another topic, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because people need to believe on, on something. And then what we do in science is, is empirical. And then need to be, and if you tell the people that we came from X, Y, and Z, and it's like, that's it, and it's all. So then what, what is the meaning of life at the end of the day, right? So then what, would, what do we do? So if we know it exactly. Uh, and then maybe it's the point of like faith on, on terms of, of just to, to anchor or uh, yourself on, or on, on something mystic, on something that is no, uh, so empirical and so logical. Well, the empiricism can only, you know, it's interesting because, yeah, we say science is founded on empiricism, which it absolutely is, but there is the theoretical moment, right, where you give a particular explanation, and like we said earlier, the theories are always evolving and changing, and sometimes the theories are just ditched altogether, and you have a new theory. Mm -hmm. And it is interesting how people believe in theories, right? There is almost a faith-based faith. side to science, and mm -hmm. I don't know if you've encountered that in the academy at all, or, or in trying to publish new ideas, sometimes you sense that there's, there's more to getting an idea out there than just doing the empirical research. You, you really have to find a way to integrate it into the belief structures that people have and fit it in and suit, like hold people's hand a little bit when you bring them a new idea because you're fighting against the weight of the faith that they have in maybe older theories. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, we work with people, right? And then you, and then you don't know what the background of the people is. You know what the faith of the people is, and you don't know what are the 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 way the trend of thinking uh, uh, on them, right? Uh, so yeah, so I I absolutely agree with what you say. So every single idea, every single paper, you need to 
hammer it to the people and then say this is a new idea this is a new uh discovery and it's something that go away from mainstream it, it takes a lot of effort and it takes a lot of uh advertisement and proven uh of of your theory or your idea or your new discovery to the main to the mainstream it takes a long time sometimes uh uh the discovery dep depends on the personality also depends on how the person is able to to communicate the results i think that's that's very important uh too with uh it may favor uh some people uh, more than more than others for example you have to communicate an idea on a, a language that's not yours like in my case for example it takes it takes more effort and and it takes a longer in order to 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 um to explain it in a way that the people like just race with the same uh with the same language and communicating in your in your own language and that's something that uh struggle many people uh, uh it's a very complicated to to do it uh yeah so i think it's just uh the human nature of just communicating ideas with each other do you think that your research is on the outskirts of the mainstream or do you think that it is just something that is waiting to be folded into it uh right now is uh outside of the of the mainstream just because magnetic fields are outside of the mainstream in general and it's an exotic uh, topic that the people as we were talking before not doesn't don't talk uh or don't take into account but i think the people are now realizing for the past several years i i, I have been feeling that the people have realized that they are missing the physics uh, of the magnetic field and they have to add it and then what we are seeing our team is that um they're asking for uh simulations that we are doing we're asking for results that we're doing in order to add it to some of the results that we're that they're doing so for example let me go a little more specific for example uh um a so yeah star formation for example so they know they have to explain uh the amount of stars in a in a galaxy and they don't know how to explain it they need to have an idea of what is strength and morphology and magnetic field we have those measurements and then the, we are the team who has it, so we have they have to add it uh, on it, and then we need to to go start collaborating between them. So other th other uh, fields, for example, we had this uh, a few years ago was a um, a new discovery for a neutrino uh, detection in one galaxy. Don't forget about the conference next April in Austin, Texas, where we're going to be getting together in person, and I would love to see you there. And they they say that it's some uh, astrophysical neutrino is coming from uh, a very local uh, uh, galaxy, and it happens to be that that galaxy has the measurements of the of the magnetic field on it. And, and I'm uh, very well studying. I know it. And I don't know anything about neutrinos at that time, like nothing at all. I know the minimum fundamental things about about them, uh, but then um, it was a, a very nice collaboration that they say, okay, we need to taking into account magnetic fields. Oh, right. So do we have measurements? What is the strength? What is the geometry? How do we add them? And then it was a collaboration of, it was a, a multidisciplinary collaboration of people who do uh, high uh, astrophysical particles. They, they don't know anything about astrophysics uh, on it. And then with us that we do pure astrophysics with magnetic field. And then that was a, a good thing. And they And then they are now putting them into their uh into the models mm. i think that you're you're pointing to something that's really important which is that theories become more accepted once they start to become useful <laughs> especially useful to people outside of your particular little world i actually might do oh goodness oh, we're missing sorry. No. i'm sorry that's my fault <laughs> i'm working the buttons i, I messed up sorry everybody uh I actually think utility has to come from outside of your field. Okay. Like, and that's that's kind of an arbitrary definition, but I feel like if you're only useful to people inside of your field, then you're not really useful to the enterprise of science, right? So if you have a bunch of Mignino hydrodynamicists and they only ever work with each other and they have all these theories, but they never actually get applied in anybody else's work, then is that really useful? I don't know, maybe. 
But well, you go for the for the for the uh, feel, and they go narrow and narrow and narrow and narrow. Eh? But what? How useful is the question that they're answered into the big picture? Right. Exactly. Exactly. And so I think that utility in science might actually derive from this ability to come up with something, and then have lots of different people encounter it and have an aha moment. Like I, I think about something like the the atomic force microscope, right? Shiloh did a lot of his work with the atomic force microscope during grad school, and it's a tool that you can use for a lot of different things. And so as soon as you have a tool, then all of a sudden you have a framework for utility. But while you just have a nebulous idea that doesn't do anything for anybody, I, I feel like it's very hard to get acceptance. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that. I think that multidisciplinary uh, work is, is is fundamental. I mean, like for uh, I I'm gonna I'm gonna make a, a, an example here. Like in the past several years, uh, I need to develop uh, some uh, analytical uh, theory on on to explain. Uh, measurement of the magnetic field in one of the galaxies that we have, and I didn't know the. I was not able to to do it by myself. But then, uh, I know that the people who study the sun, we call it the solar physicists, uh, they do that since the since the fifties, and they're like they have theories on it. They have like very well developed uh, analytic expressions of how to work with them with uh, microdynamics because the sun is a full microdynamics ball. Uh, so then I uh, had to communicate with them. Uh, and I worked with three solar physicists uh, here in the U.S. to develop uh, uh, some uh, mathematical expression to explain the magnetic field in a galaxy. And it took us a year to have the same language. Even though we were talking about the same thing, mm. the jargon is different too. So I think that the multidisciplinary work is, is very important. But the jargon is something that it just... It, it it create walls where there, there are no walls uh, because we were talking about the same math and the same physics, but the, yeah, the jargon was completely different just to say, okay, how do you define this? Okay. I define this this way. How mm. do you define this? I define this this way. Okay. So now how can we communicate in a way that we understand each other to make something new? Oh, it's so important. Mm -hmm. There's so many, there's one of our, the other topics we bring up on the show all the time is consciousness. Mm -hmm. You know, we talk to different scientists, neuroscientists, cognitive psychologists, computer programmers. And the funny thing is, some of these, a lot of these papers, they just start off talking about consciousness, but they don't define it. And then <laughs> the problem is, <laughs> everybody's talking past each other, right? Because they mean something a little bit different. And, and you wonder if people were more careful, careful about getting on the same page with these definitions, if things might go a lot smoother and people could collaborate a lot easier. I wonder how that can be standardized better. It's a really difficult task because the people that are doing the science are often not fantastic talkers. <laughs> I, yeah. I just, the technical ability to do hardcore math does not always lend itself to no. expository uh, exactly. interdisciplinary communication. And so you end up in these positions where you have these brilliant people that are just all pointing in slightly different directions. And I've never really figured out how to be able to solve that. I think it needs to be a willingness from the person to communicate with other people outside of your field. Mm -hmm. And that willingness uh, is what creates walls. I think like is if you have an open mind, I, 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 how I understand this is I collaborate with people outside of the field if they're willing to collaborate with you, of course. So is that, that, that's a, that's, you just that's show a up at their door right. and you're like, we will yeah. collaborate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, like collaborate with me. But the point is like, you need to go into something that they are interested, right? Uh, yeah. uh, right? And then like, that they are curious about and they have some passion on it. So then you open the door that way. Mm -hmm. And then like, okay, and then you open the door that way. So like, okay, now start the, the difficulty of communication. And then the communication exactly is what you say. So they are been doing the same work for X amount of years. I've been doing my work for X amount of years. So then you have your own jargon, right? So it that happening in, in, in communities and like in just in language, right? So I mean I live in a small island. Uh I did gonna change the, the topic, but like it's a small island. We all talk Spanish, but then if you go uh you drive from my hometown to another uh 
a city, which is just only 10 kilometers away, they call uh, the same object with a different uh, name, right? And then we don't communicate cor correctly. Even though we work in the same, we communicate in the same language, we just need to say, okay, you are talking about the glass? Yes, I'm talking about glass, yes. And why do you call it this way? So, and then like, it creates some friction between them, right? Even though they're not fiction, it's just a way of like, just naming things in a different, different way. And this happened the same uh, in, in, in astrophysics too. So we are in the same field. We work with the same fundamentals, but the naming is different because you are being in your close field, talking without nobody. So then you have your own language just to describe your own thing. And I think like once you open the, the, the cluster of people and then say, okay, it's interesting what you're doing here. Can I use it? So then is when you exactly when you say, okay, so now like expand your, your universe, right? Expand your words and define it. And then the definition and like, oh, I never thought about this part of the theory because you were so close and you only making the theory to work in some specific uh, environment that if you, work outside of that environment, the theory may, may completely fail. So, and then like you start, yeah, exactly. Uh, adding new things and then adding new vocabulary and making definitions more, more broad than what they were before. Well, it's interesting that we're having to kind of go back to this because back in the day when most of the science was done through letters to the Royal Society or to the to whatever group of scientists were all writing to each other, I feel like there was a baseline of understanding of the things that were even considered to be science that they were accessible. They were they were still fairly straightforward. They were still fairly surface. And if you look back at these letters, there is a very deep attempt to understand what the other people are doing, how the work applies to one another. And then over the course of the last maybe hundred years, we've gone in a very specialist direction where the journals have gone from being a fifth or sixth grade reading level across the board to being something that even when you have a PhD, you can't understand the paper from the other discipline. Like I remember when I showed yeah, up... And, and the result of that is that if your paper gets read 300 times, that's, that's a success, right? <laughs> Which yeah. is kind of wild because that's by any other standard, right? If if we make a YouTube video and it only gets three hundred views, we're kind of bummed out, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I just it, I feel like it has restricted it. But I think I don't want to cut you off to get back to that. But I think this is really inspiring because people, especially students who are maybe like in grad school right now, just starting on their career as scientists or something. One of the biggest crises is like, oh no, how do I do something meaningful in a world where it feels like everything in my discipline has kind of been sewed up already? Like, I definitely had that feeling when I first started getting into science. I was like, oh man, all the big questions are already solved. But I think what we're dancing around here is that bringing your specialty to somebody else to help them solve their problem is where it's at. Like, that's making yourself uh, taking, even though you might not be able to move the needle too much in your own discipline, you can take that knowledge and bring it somewhere and maybe it actually lead to great revolutionary understandings because you have this whole other toolkit, this whole other perspective. I think that that's really huge. I, I kind of wish somebody would have pointed that out to me when I was like 20 years old. But I think that it can be really depressing for people. Like we were talking to this guy, Adam Mastriani, who was a psychology student and very well-trained I think he was a Rhodes Scholar I found on his CV later. So this is this is a guy who's who's accomplished much inside of the framework of the academy. And he realized at some point that he hated writing papers because they wouldn't let him write the way that he wanted to write. Mm -hmm. He would send papers in for review and they would come back with reviews of, look, the work is good, but this is too fun. <laughs> And we have this vision of science writing as being something that is serious and somber and somnolent and third person objective, mm -hmm. which is really weird too, because it's the experiment was done. It's never, I did the experiment, yeah. I did this, I looked at the telescope, I analyzed the data. And so there's a, there's a sense as you go through the academy that it can be hard to find your place in the sciences because it's not a particularly humane environment sometimes. 
with grants and applications and paper reviews and needing to write to this level of scientific expectation, there's a, there's a huge conflict between the way that somebody who's a scientist would express themselves, even in a room full of their peers when they're just talking, versus what it means to put on that mantle of, I am now publishing. <laughs> I just, I wonder if there's a viable way out of that because it seems like professors are really underwater. Yeah. With all the responsibilities that are heaped on them from overseeing students to just departmental responsibilities and everything else. And so I wonder. Yeah. So, oh, okay. That was a loaded question. Uh, <laughs> so it's a lot of things uh, going on. So the... I think I think the the okay. So one is the writing, right? So like how do we write? I think the way of writing uh scientific papers are just like passive, uh and then logical to the stream. Just like it's the sentence after sentence, very close, uh very short ones, and then to the point. And the discussion is where you can be a little bit more uh open to discussion. Uh, to open uh, to ideas, uh, but is no much room to um, uh, open ideas that is like broad, general, big picture ideas that except for the specific question that you want to answer. And I think one of the reasons uh, for that is the pressure that the people have to to publish to advance in their career, right? Because it's always the point of like uh, of uh, you need to have X amount of, of papers and need to be high impact uh, uh, journal. And then uh, X amount of people need to read it and and, and not read it, but also uh, uh, cite it, right? So then uh, then the quality uh, may also change depending of, of what you want to answer, right? So oh, how fast do you, do you publish? Uh, and then what is the question you want to answer uh, to, right? So then like, you have papers that, are, for example, uh, answering one question. They're very, very fast, very easy uh, to put out, and then you don't have much, uh, much to say. And then, and then this is a new discovery. For example, the the JWST. This is new, new data. Put it out. People publishing in two or three days, uh, and then they they're out. Yes, it's very exciting. You have it, but it creates a a, a dynamics in the system that is no good for anybody. Because what you are showing there is that in order to be uh, impactful or successful is to do fast, quick, I'm going to call it dirty, sorry, but dirty science uh, out. And just because it's new and exciting, and then you want to be in the rollout, right? The writing is not going to be good. I mean, I don't, I don't say this, like, I mean, I'm talking in general, for sure, there are very good papers on, on you know, people can write in, in two days. Good I can't. writing takes time. Good writing takes time. Yeah. It takes, it takes iterations. Yeah. It takes long thought. Yeah. It takes, you, you just, you have to sit with it. And I totally get what you're saying because yeah. it sounds like the YouTube content cycle too. Mm -hmm. You can hop onto something and you can just dash something out because it's trending, mm -hmm. but it's not going to be the same sort of work that you get after weeks of thinking yeah, about yeah. something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so I think that the, the dynamics that you say, like, how can we change it? I think, like, uh, it's just the, 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 it's a, it's a busy cycle that we have uh, now. So in order to advance in, in the career, uh, to be considered to permanent positions uh, somewhere, you need to have X amount of papers, X amount of uh, conference, uh, no X amount of one specific number. You need to have, you need to show your productivity uh, somehow, and you have, need to have, on top of that, good communication skills, and uh, good networking, uh, and then being able to, to express your science in a way that the people can absorb it well and get the importance of their science, even though perhaps there some people, I mean, some science is more important than, I mean, some resources are more important than, than others, for sure. Uh, but then like the way of communicating uh, it may make it more stronger than, than, uh, than somebody else that may do a very good job because the communication is not that good. Right. I, I really want I really worry that the exclusion of the maladjusted lone autist is damaging our ability to make really big scientific leaps. 
right? Because I think that if you look through, if you look at somebody like Newton, weirdo, isolated, didn't talk to anybody, was notoriously a difficult person. Wrote a lot of letters. Wrote a lot of letters, but that's like a very, you know, you can write a lot of emails. But I think that we, I, I worry sometimes that the emphasis on the career aspects of science selects for people that are really good at the career stuff and well they're really good at defined problems as master oyani would say mm. right like there's two types of intelligence this is just one framework of looking at it but you have the type of intelligence that is selected for by tests and exams and stuff where you learn how to do a, a kind of problem that you can iterate on and get good at but there's this other kind of intelligence that doesn't get a lot of play in terms of social currency and so forth which is like how do I live a fulfilling life? How do I have a good marriage? How do I have, you know... Uh, good ideas. Yeah, how do I have good ideas? How do I look at something that hasn't been seen before and pull out new relationships? And that's something, you know, I, I don't know if you saw this paper. I think it was a Nature paper that said that disruptive science has decreased rapidly mm -hmm. in the last that's 10, 15 years. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of what Anastasia is getting at, is that as we select for people who are really good at you know, dotting the I's and crossing the T's on existing problems, we're making it more difficult for the other kind of intelligence to express itself in the sciences. It's a much more diplomatic way of saying it than how I said it. I appreciate it. Well, they're brilliant. I mean, come on. <laughs> Nasia said something about like these autists or whatever, and fair enough, but that they, they're brilliant. We know that people, the mathematicians, they, they have these people who can solve defined problems are essential to our civilization, our society. And they're usually not the people that are the social butterflies. Yeah. Right. Right? Yeah, and Go ahead. Yeah, I, I think we need to, uh, I'm going to use the mystify, the, <laughs> the, the genius uh, uh, point here, or the, or, the single, or the singularity of people in discovering things. I think that we are uh, so focused on, on finding or defining Einstein's and defining uh, uh, Stephen Hawking's and defining other people that we are uh, missing the collective uh, uh, um, group of, mm -hmm. of scientists doing it, right? So I don't think that we are in a point in any discipline of, of, of science that a discovery can be done by a single person. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think that would be maybe is a is some person that's very brilliant, but I don't think that that's the norm. And I think the groups needs to have all these uh, kind of uh, people that that you were uh, defining, right? You need to have it's, it's like a team. I, I mean, yeah, exactly, it's like a team or or or, a, or company or whatever you you want to call it, right? So you need to have these different expertise, the different uh, uh, skills uh, in order to attack big problems because if not if, if we cannot we cannot do it and then you need to have the person who exactly is very good on on finding new ideas or looking out of the box and uh, people who know how to communicate it very well and people from different uh, uh, disciplines to work on on yours to bring new ideas from from it right uh but then but then like who do you want the so then like who gets the the ownership of the mm -hmm. discovery, right? Or who gains the ownership of it, right? So I think that that's another that's another issue too, right? Then you get into personalities. And then like who has the egos and who is willing to advance the career of the person who actually deserve it within the within the team. Mm -hmm. uh, and then like because we are so into oh one single person did this. We still have Nobel Prizes. And Nobel Prizes, yes, we give the Nobel Prize now to three people. But three people are just the top of the pyramid of like thousands of people behind him. And we still want to put the discovery into a name of a single person. So why are we still doing that rather than do it to teams? And then you develop it into the teams and then you give prizes or awards or recognizing to the full thousand people that did this at any level that they do it, right? But, but then like, but they do it because you still have yeah, this single idea of like principal investigators or or leaders of, of programs. But then at the end of the day, yes, the scientists, but it's management at the end of the day, management of large team to solve one single problem of it. And that person just may have the idea, but it won't be done without all the people behind it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's there's, absolutely There's true. something about that where humans just need somebody to look up to. And it's very, you need a base on that, right? It's very difficult with a team of people to, 
to look up to this great team of a thousand people. Like, how should I aspire to be like that? Well, you're an individual. So, you know, I think the reason we, we want these superheroes in science is because we want a role model, essentially. We want to look at somebody and, you know, how many books are there about Einstein's life and like what he ate for breakfast and like everything, right? Because people want to know all those details because they want to, they're aspiring to be great like that. And so I think that we just inherently need these faces. And sometimes it works against us because obviously, like you said, once you get involved in science, you realize that you're not getting anything out there all by yourself. Like no matter how good your idea is, doesn't matter. You're going to have to work with people. You're going to have to integrate your ideas into a bigger landscape. I, mm -hmm. I do think though, and I'm perfectly happy to be shouted down by both of you. So this is fine. But I do think that there's something about the person who's able to sit at the helm of something like that. Like I, uh, my, my oh, parents, sure. my parents came from Russia. I mean, I was technically born there. And one of the things that has always been a really interesting tension is the way that the reaction against the American capitalist structure wants to erase the idea of the genius. So you look at somebody like Steve Jobs. Can you have Apple without Steve Jobs? Probably not. And so you can still have a company. It could be a good company, but it could be something like that stupid app called Yo, which was an app that literally its whole purpose was that you opened it and it just said yo on the screen. You know, so there's there's someone who has a vision, who has the steel in them when everybody tells them it's a stupid vision to pull the people together, to inspire them, to lead them, to organize them. And I I we saw this actually, we did this project after grad school where we weren't sure what we wanted to do. But we knew that we wanted to do something that was going to be somehow intentional. Like we didn't want to continue along the academic path in a pure way. And so what we did is we wanted to study how people ran businesses in a way that was really moral. And so we uh, did a tour of worker-owned businesses around the country and we talked to all these people. And every single worker-owned business that had been around for a generation that the founder was starting to get old was in the same problem we don't have anyone who can replace this person and it's going to fall apart. And so on one hand, I totally agree that the way that we have structured science, where there's a thousand people that have worked on a scientific project and three people get a Nobel Prize, that's absurd because they're cutthroat, they cut each other out. It, it really damages people's ability to collaborate because you hear about this on projects where people won't include somebody else because they're concerned about what it might do to the, the the Nobel Prize distribution down the road. We had this actually with uh, Brian Keating. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. So Brian Keating was on a big project f looking for B-field polarization evidence as leftover from the Big Bang. And he ended up being kind of pushed out from one of the projects because there were already three scientists on the project mm -hmm. and th there wasn't space for a fourth. <laughs> and so you know that it happens and you know that it's bad but on the other hand with the parents communist background and the way that they talk about it there's a real danger of not highlighting individual accomplishment and pushing people to those heights because mm -hmm. otherwise we miss something and so the 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 road forward has to be somewhere in the middle yeah i get i get my my only critique is like at what cost mm -hmm. Uh, and then also is that uh, what what are the other aspects of the person that we are elevating mm. uh, uh, personally and ethically, right? So it may be very good on yeah a scientific idea, but maybe no good on personal uh, uh, treatment uh, with people, or have a very radical ideas on a, whatever topic. Uh, that's the problem with heroes in general. <laughs> This is like one of the most painful things for me to learn in all of life, I think, was that the people I looked up to, you know, my whole life, I would always, I would slowly discover that they weren't perfect people, essentially, mm -hmm. which sounds so ridiculously naive, I understand, but it was still painful to realize this. I because would... people can be incredible artists, they can make incredible music, and they can live a life that has nothing to do with that. No. Yeah. 
I was just going to say, it's like not even perfect, but sometimes people just aren't that good. That's not a thing that they <laughs> yeah. aspire to. And that's, and that's, I think, really heartbreaking, right? Because how do you deal with that? How do you deal with wanting excellence in one realm, but knowing that if you reward the excellence in that realm, you're rewarding... Like, Heisen wasn't it Heisenberg was a Nazi or something? I think so. Right? I mean, <laughs> what are you going to do? Are you going to just ignore Heisenberg's ideas because he was a Nazi? No. Yeah. Yeah, like maybe you, and so the alternative is that you strip the ideas from him, right? You name it something like you you name it mm. some other principle. You don't let it stay Heisenberg's principle. Yeah, yeah, by the name, yeah, by the physical quantity or whatever it is. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and I think that that's what happened, right? The uncertainty principle, rather than mm -hmm. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Yeah. Yeah, I think the, my only issue is, is just that it's just like it just try to remove and um, uh, the idealistic uh, uh, of the ideal of, of one genius solve it all. Uh, mm -hmm. I just don't like. I just I don't agree with uh, with with that. Yes, you need visionaries and you need people who, with ideas. You need people who push it. Uh, but I don't think. A one person by themselves do everything in order to accomplish the idea or the vision that they that they have. Yeah. They need to have the the, the people around, uh, and then also because yeah, because the the person may not be as perfect as uh, as we think. So the whole idea of, of the of the inclusion and the diversity, you know, that uh, that all academy is pushing uh, right now, trying to to avoid those kind of uh, those kind of things. Uh, it takes long time for sure. Uh, but I guess in, in the long term, it may may help and try to at least minimize or uh, reduce uh, these um, uh, very bad behaviors of uh, a few people that are basically using grad students and students to do whatever they want to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, along those lines, I wonder if you have thought at all about how the academy could be restructured in like some, if you were like king of the world for a minute, <laughs> you know, because... I you know I actually had a I had a singular and really wonderful experience at the end of my tenure at the you know I still teach at the university but when I was doing research and I was in this incredible lab that from what I understand was almost impossible where my advisor was in the physics department he was also in the biology department we had students from mechanical engineering material science biophysics uh where else all over basically everybody was from a different department and so I felt like that gave us a lot of power, but I don't think that that's a model anybody else is really following. And so I guess I'm, it's like a two part question. Like is something like that more sustainable where you could see more fully dedicated interdisciplinary efforts, like groups centered on inter interdisciplinary effort. And in addition to that, like what other ways do you think that we could make academic science stronger? Is there a better way to go about it than what we're doing right now? So, okay. So for for the first part, uh, I all all about that. So I think that interdisciplinary is the way to to move forward in any in any discipline, any field. And uh, most of uh, some of the um, positions that have been seeing or, or trends uh, on departments, at least in, in physics and astronomy, is to try to open a new collaborations with uh, data science or or computer science. Uh, Analysis it's, it's a very easy, straightforward uh, uh, relationship because we need algorithm and computer science are the, are the perfect people for for that. And mathematicians too, and physicists. Um, there is also some communication with um, uh, material uh, development uh, in the lab, just to know what are the spectra spectroscopy properties of of material. So then we have a spectrum that we can compare with. Uh, with what we observe in the in the galaxies, I think that you have the chemistry department with uh, with you, and uh, I think that's the, the the way the people are pushing too. Uh, I see also people doing uh, um, how's it called um, GPS development, uh, for example, uh, for satellites and, and and communication with the astrophysics department too. I think that's also a very good uh, collaboration. I think it, it's moving in that direction uh, too. Uh, some of the departments that have the possibility to do it and they're open to do it and they have the resources uh, for that. So then you can imagine that departments that are 
maybe more uh they have more freedom financially uh can start open como, uh, collaborations uh, like that more than uh colleges that are maybe more narrow into uh, financial things mm -hmm. and, uh, and for the second part yeah you know you mentioned the grad students kind of being used as as forced labor essentially yes. is that feed into how you imagine that the structure could be more robust in the future is there some yeah. change to that you can imagine yeah yeah i think i think we need to yes i think that i mean the grad students I mean, they're 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 there for a reason, right? So they have a passion, uh, and they what you don't uh, you are not in grad school just because uh, you want to have you, uh, just because. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a lot of work, and also uh, uh, and and time. And then you have people who have passion and want to work on on solving a problem. Uh, they don't know specifically the problem it is, so that there is that mentorship you know, advising, you have it there in order to, to guide the, the people. But that, that's the point. It's like guiding the passion and the question that the person itself is interested to answer. And then the department is there or the mentors are there just to bring the, the idea, the, the ideas or the resources to whatever the person is, to, is, want to, is want to answer, right? So maybe the first year or second year the student perhaps don't know the, the full, um, uh, nuances of the uh, of a field, but you need to you need to do it that way. You, you need to just guide it. You know, I, I, my idealistic point of view is just like, what are you interested in? So, what are your interests? What do you want to answer? What kind of work do you want to do? Uh, and then from there, like, is that is something in both ways that we can that we can uh, uh, collaborate and work? It's a win win between both of us, right? So, like, it's something that I can provide to you that you can, that I can serve your your major uh, idea and it's something that uh, that you can do on the on the field that I'm working on, you know, and we can do work. I think that I think that's my approach at least on working with with the grad students and students here. So normally, if it's not a good fit, fit meaning like if working on on a, a topic that I'm not I don't know anything about it, like well, I don't have the resources to guide you here. Like even though we we personally match very well and we we get along very well but if one other resources are no are not useful for, for the person so then like what, what are we doing here and you can point it to to people who can do it right i think that that i think that is the, the main idea the point is when you are when you as a, as a professor as a researcher that you have a leading project and you have a programmatic uh, uh items that you need to accomplish uh, every year so then, and then because you have to submit some document at the end of the year for to in order to get more money uh, later on. So then you have pressures there, right? So then, like, how do you deal with the pressure on how uh, realistic are those ones uh, in order to accomplish? And then, like, if the people are overachieving, uh, not overachieving, like over asking things for whatever project. So then, if when the pressure became and when the people are like, okay, now I need to make this person uh to do whatever i want and i don't care about what you what you want to do and i think that is uh, that's an issue and the issue is coming from all the system of like getting grants and promotion and stuff and then put the pressure down into the people who don't have the career done yet mm. and they are passionate and they have the time so they're like okay you want to work on this so then work on that and some people don't care much about it uh but then like yeah how much do you care about the person that you have and the willingness of of let it, the person grow or just like this is the most important topic because it's a hot topic and you need to do it and then only think about this and then out uh, and then people would use would use i don't think the word use but i'm gonna use the word use but they like make the the free labor uh of this person in order to advance the science uh, for just a, a, a person for the for the lead of the project uh, uh, ego, I guess, at the end of the day. I don't know if that answered your question or not. <laughs> I went well, yeah, it's interesting. And it ties into just a bigger discussion of how, how this could work better and how we can make space for more out of the box, uh, let's say, unpromising ideas, right? Because you mentioned, you know, somebody comes to your lab, and they're like, I want to work on this topic. And you're like, well, I don't, I, don't, I can't help you with that. 
And so I feel like there is a lot of orphaning of ideas because there isn't an established lab, you know. One of the scariest times in grad school is when you first show up and they say, okay, pick a lab. And like, maybe you've been corresponding with some professors or something, you know, that's probably a good idea. But a lot of the, you know, I, I don't know if we lost anybody during that period, but there was some people who really struggled finding a home because mm. each lab is very narrowly constrained. And um, I just wonder if in terms of, if this is driven by funding and being able to secure a line of research, I wonder if there isn't space in the future for funding that's directly applied only to totally unpromising experiments, you know, because that's often where the innovation might come in also yeah. at the same time. Yeah. So the, there is a, 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 a cycle there, right? So like usually you write a, a, a project uh, uh, to, to have funding, you know, in an agency. Uh, but then like, normally you write something that's like, it's already half cooked. And then you have proven uh, of it, and then you want to do something, something else, and you want to do a little bit of other project. And those ones are the ones that usually usually work because you have uh, the, the you have people who are going to review. I need to have an assessment of the risk, of the outputs of the project, right? And then you as a scientist are in a, in a very bad point here. Like what is the risk of something that I don't know? And like, how do you quantify that risk? And then if you are not able to quantify it in a way that uh, it passed that uh, set of reviewers, so then any single big ideas and high risk, uh, you know, uh, uh, it can just doesn't go through. Mm. Uh, so then, so then maybe it's like one of the things is well, so uh, so yes, I'm gonna write something that I already have it maybe a little bit done. I submitted, I know that it, it was going on. And then with the funding, you can just do whatever. I mean, you need to, you need to um, accomplish what you say in the, in the proposal. Uh, but then also you have, if you have time, you can also do uh, more risky uh, things with, with the team that you mm. have, uh, you have secured uh, job and you have secured uh, funding. Do you hear about that a lot where people are working in the in the gaps in between projects where they secure enough funding for a lab to be able to run and then when those things are under their own weight that they can come in and they can start to ask other questions and so i think that that's a really good point yeah yeah so i think like what well, i mean it's something that we call soft money uh so like i'm i pay myself through through grants uh so then i don't have like a long term like uh, a permanent job uh so then uh, one of the things that I like uh, to do is like I have exactly so the obligations of the grant that I need to do that I can accomplish. But then because I manage my own time, I normally spend a, a fair amount of my time on new ideas, a new idea with the team that I have around me. And this is like all the simulation from of you, for example, or talking with other people, working with the, with the solar physics, working with the neutrino people, for example, right? So like it's new ideas here because it's exactly what you were saying before. Uh, we need to be disciplinary, and, and then I don't know what the implications of my work is in other field. So I want to work. I want to talk with other people, and they say, "What do you need? What what can I offer you in order to do it? Oh, hey, I have done this. Is it useful for you? Or what kind of modify in order to make it useful? Right? And that is where all the the new ideas and uncertainty." in the job uh, come from but that's the exciting part at least for for me because i don't have the obligations of uh the teaching a class for example or the services except if i want to if i want to do it and the students that come to me are usually uh well i now have like undergrads and, and grad students and they come they come with idea with the undergrads I, I present ideas to them and they're like these are a few ideas here i think the output is going to be something like this and if you're interested i can uh, we can work together and their undergrads on on CS and um, physics, uh, usually they come they come uh, to work with me, and yeah, and then those those ideas are basically like new ideas that I don't have the time to develop it, but a student can can do it, and then I present a few of them, and they they do it right, and then they, for example, the CS it was one of the CS students was interested in uh, in apply algorithm, a uh, new algorithm to to physics uh, problems. I was like, well, I have a, a project for you. So I have an algorithm that I don't have time to apply, but it will be useful for doing this, this, and this, and this. And, and he has all the background of the CS, which is fantastic. 
And then he found it very, very interesting. And that was a good match between both of us, right? Mm. And ended up to be uh, more disciplinary than I thought uh, at the beginning. It's a new idea. So he ended up with, with, uh, with a publication, which is very good as an undergrad, which is fantastic. In the undergrad, I was figuring out where the, where the cafeteria was. And these people are uh-huh. publishing papers. So like, you know, this is another level. Uh, but then it's also, you know, you learn a lot from, from other, other fields because they come from all the CS, uh, background that I don't have. And then I give them the physics background that they don't have. Right. And you got, and you get it from, from there. And then with the grad students and you have the obligations that they need to have a PhD at the end and need to be coherent and need to be, have some overarching idea. Right. So then there, uh, uh, you can be, it's also a long-term project too. So you have four or five years of uh, leasing European time, four or five years for the PhD here in the US, maybe nine years, but depending on the other institution, right? Uh, but it's a long-term, right? So you can be the first two, two years, you can be a little bit more um, uh, erratic, uh, not erratic, meaning more experimental mm. and try new ideas and try new things. And then there, I guess there is places where you can, uh, be more experimental and more risk on the on those ones for sure do you do you think that you will stay a professor is there anything that would drive you out uh, uh, right now i really enjoy academia I, I i like the the be frustrated on on the data every every day uh, i don't know it's painful but i find it very fascinating uh, still working with the students, I, I really like it, and the collaborations, I really like, I really like that. Uh, so I will still continue uh, doing, uh, so following this path. Uh, if it tends, uh, it tends out to be a professor, professor, or or a soft money is still okay. I have a lot of freedom uh, right now, uh, so that that's nice. Uh, what drive me? Uh, what will drive me out? I guess the soft money is complicated. Uh, because it depends of, of grants. So if I cannot sustain this, uh, that will drive me out and I don't get a, a permanent position somewhere. So that will be maybe I will need to think about going other, other and doing other things. Um, years ago, uh, when I was living in, in Austin, I, I was a postdoc, uh, there. And as a foreigner, uh, my, my visa depends on, on the, on the job. So my money as a postdoc was running out. So I was thinking, well, so, and I was not, uh, getting any position. So then I was like, well, now it's time to get another, another job. <laughs> so that was a time that also was inflection point. It's just like, I want to stay in the U S. Uh, be, uh, and then, uh, the, the way to stay, I need to, to have another, need to get a visa. So that was a way to maybe to get a job in other field that was in astronomy. Mm. Uh, I got something here uh, at NASA, very close by where I work now. Uh, so then I, I got the, the green card through, through that. Uh, but drive me out, I guess that just uh, is some personal uh, issues or family issues for sure. Uh, I think family is very important to me. So I think that uh, goes above uh, everything. It's something I with the family. For sure, I will take a break. Uh, and but you know for now i think i'm i'm fine with uh with it or maybe when i retire in i don't know two years and then give me some money and then i will retire and then spend uh, the time doing things with, with my family and 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 my mom i guess yeah i think that there's a mindset that pulls people into it right it's the only place in the world where you get paid to explore <laughs> Yep. In a way that's not tied to the production of a good or service at the end of it. Because you can go work at a startup, but the startup is inherently tied to you're going to make a product and that product is going to be useful and we're going to make a lot of money and there's going to be stock options and everything else. And it's utilitarian in a way that I think pure science is... Especially astronomy. Especially astronomy. It's blessedly freed from that kind of utilitarianism. And I think that... It's really important for us to have a place where people can go to work on questions that do not have immediate bearing on the material world in yeah. the sense of just, you know, you can come up with, like you were saying, we have camera sensors that are are developed for astronomy, but in the grand scheme of things, it's just this 
pure curiosity pursuit. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why I love doing this podcast, right? Because it's just an exercise in looking into people's minds, figuring out what we know about nature, what we don't know about nature, where we're going. And the ability to translate between disciplines is so satisfying. Because mm -hmm. we have people, and sometimes I realize that they're talking about different things, but they're using different words. Yeah. Same things, different words. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. And yeah. that's such a, it's such a cool position to be in, to be able to draw those lines together and to, to help everything coalesce. And I really, I, I appreciate being able to talk to people like you. Yeah. Yeah. I think as long, uh, as far as one has a curiosity about something, it will continue. Uh, mm -hmm. trying to satisfy that curiosity. Yeah, because like, what would you do if you retired? You'd just not be curious anymore? No, I would be curious, that for sure. I, 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 don't think, I don't think that that will stop to me, but, but I won't, uh, I, I, will, I will guess that, I would think that uh, the curiosity will stay, but the amount of hour and effort that will do to satisfy that curiosity would change, mm -hmm. right? Because, because it's more things that, than astronomy. Is more life, more more interesting things that 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 what what we're doing. Uh, but the point is like, uh, yeah. So what is the the balance between what do you so the the job uh, uh, in uh, itself with the yeah with the umbrella of curiosity that one have and which one do you want to satisfy in order to uh, um, to sleep well at night? I guess uh, one time. Yeah. If you were freed from the grant and money systems, like let's say you could retire, become an independently wealthy baron that just studied whatever you wanted, what would the baron version of yourself study? The baron, so you know, like something that I I like uh, uh, to do a lot is like is uh, I do uh, cross stitch, uh, you know, <laughs> no, 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 for, oh yeah, for real, uh, uh, and then. Um, I go uh, shy. Yeah. I knit. No, I no, no, I'm not shy. No, no, no. Like uh, with uh, because of my 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 family. So my mom uh, uh, did it, and then I I learned a skill uh, through her. And I do very elaborated uh, uh, cross stitch and stuff. Uh, you know, with uh, with her, and I see. Uh, oh, she does. She did it because of, of uh, it was a way of getting uh, uh, money in order to sustain my brother and me, right? But she became a really good uh, person to to do it in the in the village, and then it was a skill that she transferred to to me, and then now I find joy on, on doing that. And then when we both are are together, we do it uh, things together, you know, like some patchwork uh, together and all this, right? Like very elaborated abstract uh, things, and then like that uh, that's a passion uh, too, and it's a, a lot of curiosity, and then it's very geometrical too, you know, it's a it's a thing, it's a point of like using math and geometry and then and something manual uh, too, and then a lot of dedication on something, right? And the passion there is the sharing passion with somebody that you love, mm. right? My, my mom, for example, right? So then that, that's uh, a thing, like if I have time, uh, that would be something that it will fulfill as, as much as I'm doing uh, right now with, uh, with science. And I don't have the bearing of, the financial period, you know, mm -hmm. I would just be free to do sit with somebody that like doing something that it, it, it fulfill us uh, both at the same time, for example. That's really beautiful. Right. I, uh, I totally know what you mean though about fiber art and the, the very exacting process of it. I got into embroidery a little bit where I was making like embroidered portraits and landscapes and paintings and stuff. Mm -hmm. And it pulls you. I mean, it's. I'm sure that it's. It's nowhere near as 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 complex as what your mother is doing after an entire lifetime. But even standing on the edge of that, I can see how deep it is, and how how much substance there is to be able to figure something like that out. That's yeah. very cool. I'd love to see some of it if you have it somewhere. It, yeah, I have some. I can send uh, some pictures of. of <laughs> yeah, uh, please yeah. do. So so yeah so like I mean you have a. Uh, 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 tribus uh, and then um, um, full cultures just uh, passing around, you know, like full blankets with the history of people uh, with brotherly and, and doing the patchwork on them, you know, just to, to put it somewhere. Uh, and then, I mean, it's, it's, it's a, 
yeah, it's a lot of uh, things that you can do uh, with it. And then it passed through generation on generation in order to, uh, to, to follow traditions and, and knowledge, right? There was no, uh, maybe a way of communicating of writing, but it's uh, the way to pass in stories is through images. Right, uh, yeah, especially in the Canary Islands, right? Seriously mm -hmm. long history there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's really yeah, fun. that must have been a really incredible place to grow up. Yeah, yeah, it was very, very nice. Very nice. I mean, you have good skies, good food, beach, <laughs> so it's very, very good. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of strange growing up in America because the history that you're taught is very shallow. Like it goes back a couple hundred years. Mm -hmm. And then you're taught, well, there was some indigenous people here and that's about it. And you know, <laughs> good luck figuring out what they were doing. It's even weirder being a Soviet because my family history goes back like two, three generations. Mm. That's it. Mm. But yeah. I mean, like, w we literally have no idea what happened. Are they were all uh, here, since two generations here in the U.S.? Or so or everyone except... So my family's immediate, like mom, dad, sister, brother, we're the only ones that are in this hemisphere. And so we have some people that are in Australia, we have some people that are in Germany, some in Israel, but a lot of them are still in, in Russia. Mm -hmm. And like no one has any history that goes beyond a couple of generations. And so I, I definitely understand where Shiloh's coming from. Of just there's this cliff that you walk up to. Yeah. 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 I mean, my, my hometown is. Uh uh 500 years old i think or oh, 550 something like that uh so i really i really my my hometown is already uh older than, than the u.s <laughs> that's, that's incredible uh my mom grew up in a secret soviet nuclear city oh wow that they just like put a pin on a map and we're like that we need to build a power plant there and wow. they just built it, and they and they moved there, and that was it, out in Siberia. But it has a, a, a stories about about the the city and stuff, or, or she want to share uh, stories about it, or she actually she took me there when I was a, oh. when I graduated high school. She took me. We went from Beijing on the railroad mm -hmm. to the town that she grew up in, and her sister was still there, and she, her sister was still living in the apartment that they had been born in, and so there was some roots there, but. The kids grow up, they leave, and so there's not none of the family is left there anymore. Everybody's moved, and so like the final thread has been broken. Mm -hmm. Do you think they would go back to the Canary Islands? Um, that's the same question that my mom asked me since I moved out. <laughs> 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 and then, uh, uh, I don't know. I, I, I certainly the question, the answer is like, I don't know. Uh, the point is that right now. My career is here. My my life is uh is here uh, uh too, and I really like it. Um, eh, the Canary Islands, um, academically speaking, uh, there is a strong in astronomy. Uh, they're very nice, but there is no many opportunities, and the system is is not very open to to new um uh, to people who has left uh from from the from the Spanish uh, system in the uh, university system. Mm. Um, uh, but besides that, uh, it's, but I mean, the family's there, which is it's a strong thing for me to, to come back. Uh, but for now, just being most of my adult uh, life outside of, of, the, of, of the islands. Um, so I think for now I will be okay uh, to live outside. And if in no position, uh, maybe in the university there or some family things that I need to come back. Uh, I don't think I will be coming back to to the US. Mm -hmm. uh, to the US, sorry, to the Canary Islands. Yeah, yeah, I got you. I got you. Yeah, there's no place like home. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that way about Ohio? I do a little bit. I mean, it's just the smell when you return back to some place you haven't that you grew up. You, it's just the the intangible aspects of it. The way that people talk and the way that people carry themselves is very comforting. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I think I think that's that's the uh, yeah that's good. I mean, I feel home every single time that I I come back uh, to the to the island. But I but see it as a long term uh, permanent position uh, just to to live there. Uh, I don't see it uh, yet. Uh, I see it like it's a it's a, a small 
uh, town and I don't know, it's very complicated to to move uh, outside and and the opportunities to do things culturally are also a little bit uh, limited uh, too. So uh, you will enjoy nature, we will love it. Uh, and then the the family and friends I have from from all my life and will be uh, will be nice. Uh, but then I need to fulfill the rest of the of the day, uh, right? With, uh, with <laughs> Yeah, that's the, that's the crazy thing about growing up is that you have to strike out on your own and make your own way. I think mm -hmm. that that's just people have been doing that for a long, long, long time. And it's tragic because on one hand it means that you have to go halfway across the world and do your thing and be on your own. But on the other hand, it's kind of the journey that humans have been on for forever. Yeah. And so it feels like diving into that river in some way. Yeah, so I, I live in, in, in San Antonio, in Texas, for, for a while. Uh, and then I discovered there that San Antonio was founded by 14 families from the Canary Islands. Uh, I, didn't know, I didn't know about that. So then I, I entered a very uh, a rabbit hole. Uh, in terms of like, uh, I don't know where those 14 families uh, were and why were 14 families from the Canary Islands there. And I was writing my thesis at that time. So I did something to distract myself of writing the thesis. Of so, course. <laughs> so, so then I discovered uh, this uh, thesis uh, from, uh, from a person in, in Louisiana State University who had the same question. It's like, what, uh, what uh, happened with the 14 families in the in San Antonio, how they reach there, and it looks like that the person track the the boat uh, that uh, arrived in in Florida from the Canary Islands with fifty something uh, families from the from the Canary Islands, and they did a trip uh, to somewhere in Texas to start creating uh, small uh, villages uh, for the for the Spanish uh, kingdom at that time. Uh, so then like on the way of Florida to to uh Texas they uh, so the family the families stop in different uh places. Oh. Uh, and then some of them are like in Louisiana and Alabama there are small villages uh founded by by uh, Canadian Islanders. And they ha still have all the all the the culture from it. You know they celebrate the the day of the Canary Islands. They uh, some uh, that they they dress up with the typical Canary Islands uh, dress. They do the boulder from uh, the, all the uh, cross stitching from the Canary Islands. They have all the culture still there. I mean, they're the generation and generation of people. So they it's a it's a very weird tradition right now. You know, like really Canarian island because it, it match it, it mix with the people from uh, from the U.S. Uh, mm -hmm. too. Uh, but then my point here is that it's a it's a strong. A, a history of people from the Canary Islands moving out from from them, and it's only the Canary Islands are only two million people right now, two million people. Which, uh, but uh, back in the time, maybe like a half a million or a million in seven islands, or just a few, uh, you know. And then it's a history from centuries of of people who live in the in the island going around the world and then do other things. We have, uh, so we call, for example, we call Venezuela. As the seventh uh, island, it's six islands. It's the it's mm. eight, seven island in the so we call it the extra island because it was a lot of uh, uh, immigration from the Canary Islands to Cuba and Venezuela because Spain uh, had a dictatorship at the time. Uh, Franco was there, mm. so they went to Cuba, and Venezuela because uh, just to to get more, to get money and also to be killed by the dictatorship because they were against uh, uh, him. Uh, so then they bring their new culture, uh, new jargon, uh, and also new expertise uh, uh, too. So then they, after after a few decades, they uh, come back to the Canary Islands with new families and with new culture and new language from their places to the Canary Islands. And the Canary Islands is a mix of Cuban, Venezuela, and Hispanic uh, culture. And Cuba used a lot of uh, jargon from the Canary Islands too, and a lot of mix uh, there. So it's a, it's being like I don't know it's very interesting that a very small place, uh, just an uh, isolated island, and it has a lot of when you go into the details of what the people have done in in several centuries, 
is a lot of Canary Island, uh, Islanders that have been going around the world and then created villages and then changed the culture of, of, the, of the places. That's really fascinating to me because there seems like there is this spirit of exploration in the that comes from the Canary Islands. But if you think about it, you couple that to the fact that people have been in the Canary Islands for thousands of years, which is really fascinating. So the, some of the earliest sea explorers, I mean, how far are the Canary Islands from the mainland? Pretty far, right? Yeah, they're like 100 miles from <sighs> South Sahara and, so and 3,000 miles from mainland Spain. So imagine being 100 miles out from the coast several thousand years ago. It's like it boggles the mind what types of people would have that kind of tenacity and, and exploration in their spirit to be just yeah. Yeah. sailing around 100 miles from the shore in Bronze Age ships or something. It's just yeah, whatever crazy to think is, about. Yeah. So yeah. you're selecting for a, a very hardy type of explorer <laughs> to begin with. It must yeah, be. funny. You're saying because like most people wouldn't ever get that far from shore yeah i just can't imagine the type of people that would settle an island 100 miles miles from shore in pre-sailing culture you know yeah i'm trying to figure out when when people got there i think it's a very very old history yeah it's all the the issue there is like the spaniards uh, at that time when they went there and kill everybody because of what the Spaniards did at that time, of course. Uh, the, right? And they didn't. They didn't even mix. They just like. They just like. Seriously, just kill. It was a, a some original people in the islands before the Spaniards uh, discovered the the islands. Uh, but we don't have the history from them. We don't know where the people come from, and that mm -hmm. is, is a very uh, annoying thing because they have a full vocabulary and they have their own culture. They have a. Uh, goats and they're like where the gods come from i mean where and they have uh also like hieroglyphics uh where they have the full vocabulary on on that case and they have their um a way of uh of building uh utensils uh you know and then um bowls to to eat and to drink you know like there was a it was some culture there uh but then it's it's not much uh knowledge of where that come from or 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 what they were doing there History uh, is scattered with examples of that, though. We come across this on the podcast a lot, where there's just these missing gaps in our understanding. We had a really fascinating conversation with this guy about a town, a town, about this ancient fortress that they found in China called Shumao. Mm -hmm. And it has all these really Mesoamerican looking building blocks inside the facade, but it's a thousand years before Mesoamerica. And the building blocks appear to have come from somewhere else because it's not like the facade is uniformly patterned in Mesoamerican blocks. They clearly appear to have been taken from somewhere else because they're like inserted upside down in different places, mixed in with other blocks. And so there's some other civilization that appears to have had the precursor cultural signifiers of Mesoamerica, mm. and we have no idea. Mm -hmm. yeah. it just, it's just absolutely hidden to history, and it's just gone. And yeah. so I think that history is littered by that stuff. Yeah, yeah. So like one funny uh, thing, you know, like once uh, I was working in, uh, uh, so I was working in NASA for four four years or something like that, and then my 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 friends uh, now call me like the Canadian that that flew the highest uh, <laughs> because I was uh, flying in you know in this airplane at uh, uh, forty five thousand feet over the sea level in the oh, stratosphere. Wow. Uh, and then we had the history of the explorers, you know, like around the, the sea level, you know, on the ground. But then my friends were like, you know, we don't have the, the history of what happened vertically with the Canary Islands, uh, with the Canary Islanders. So they call me jokingly like the Canarian that, that flew the, the highest. Uh, Wait, hold on. What were you doing 45,000 feet above the, the earth? So I was working in a project in, in NASA called SOFIA. It's called Stratospheric Observatory for Far Infrared Astronomy. Uh, there's a Boeing 747 with a airplane, with a telescope in the back oh, cool. uh, of the airplane. Uh, so then, uh, in order to uh, be above the the water vapor of the of the uh, of the atmosphere that absorbs all the infrared uh, wavelength, you need to go to space or you need to go to the stratosphere. So I was flying with the with the airplane uh, to taking uh, infrared observations uh, of magnetic fields 
in galaxies uh, that we were talking for a few years uh, uh, just to do to test new instrumentation and to do new uh, and to do new science that we were discussing before today. Was it significantly different than flying in an airplane? Because that's only like fifteen thousand feet higher. Yeah, it's, it's uh, uh, no, it's, it's this uh, Boeing seven forty seven, and also you have less uh, less turbulence uh, too. It's actually more calm to be at forty five thousand feet than uh, than a regular uh, airplane. Interesting. Yeah, the cabin is the same, except that you don't have. Uh, so it's a, it's a typical Boeing seven forty seven, very the one of the old ones from like twenty years ago or, or more. So, and then all the cabin, all the seats are out and then only 10 of us uh, flying and you have like a few computers and the telescope in the, in the back. And then the airplane is open, has a window that, that they open uh, in order to, to observe with the, with the telescope. Do you know why they don't normally fly that high? Um, the, the, uh, the commercial ones? Yeah. Um, I don't know. The Boeing 747 can go to 45 to 50. So I don't know if the commercial, maybe it's something, I don't know, actually. I don't know if, if it's, uh, is some restrictions, air restrictions or. <laughs> They're like, that's where the UFOs are. We can't go up there regularly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't know. Uh, maybe it's like some, uh, restrictions of, of, of the air policies or something like that. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure about, about it. But the higher you go, the less turbulence or the more efficient uh, for the fuel point of view is. But you take longer to go to up. It could be like a safety thing too, because I know that in the event of the cabin decompression, they only have enough air in those little masks that drop down to get you back down to 8,000 feet or something, which is what they pressurize the cabin to. So the higher yeah, you go, be- the more time it takes to descend, the more oxygen you need to pack away. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it can be that too. Yes, I don't know. I was thinking radiation. Uh, radiation is worse, probably. Wait, that's yeah, what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, because it's like people, you know, like people flying red eyes all the time for work and stuff, just getting their daily doses. Probably yeah. wouldn't be good. Probably lost waiting. I don't know if the airlines care about that. <laughs> I don't yeah, know. No, I don't think so. No, no, <laughs> no. Uh, yeah, yeah. I got a, a fair amount of radiation. I think I never measured it, but you have measured it. Uh, but I'm I'm sure it's fine. Just take your vitamins. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> Just use your vitamins. It'll be all right. <laughs> uh, this has been this has been really fun, and mm-hmm. I hope that we get to do it again. Yeah, yeah, it's fun too. Yeah, I really appreciate you coming. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, for having me and having a discussion about my tech field, which is very rare, but need to be uh, discussed and advertised and the rest of uh, uh, discussion that we have about life in general and academy. Does as the highest canarian that ever lived, do you do you have any closing thoughts? Um, no, I think that uh, as a astrophysicist, I think uh, people should open their minds into the full electromagnetic spectrum and physics uh, more than gravity in general, and think about the magnetic fields uh, as an important uh, phenomena in all full aspects of, of physics. I think that if somebody in physics uh, are, or astrophysics are uh, hearing this, I think it's very exciting uh, new um, advantage that, and observatories that we have and uh, new ideas uh, also uh, to put on, uh, on test uh, that is still open uh, feel for, for everybody. Mm-hmm. I love it. Yeah, and it seems like there's just so many open questions. It's just really fertile ground for development. I feel like I feel like there's going to be a lot of exciting breakthroughs in the coming years. And mm-hmm. I just love thinking about the future as being more full spectrum, where people are looking at more than just the narrow things that were easy to see. So that's very cool. Mm-hmm. That's very cool. Yeah. Let's catch up down the line. It was really good. Thank yeah, you. thanks for spending the afternoon with us. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, again, I think that all the invitation was good and talking with you both are being very, very nice. But we have been two hours and a half talking and it looks like 10, ten minutes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, man. Well, have a great rest of your day all right. and good luck in the future and, yeah. uh, in all your endeavors. See you. All right. All right good night, everybody. Bye. Bye.